Dale play. Ya. Transmite. Hello. Listo. ¿Ah? Sí, ya activen los audios. Ya voy a activar aquí. Hola. Probando. Probando. Hola, hola, probando. Eso en donde se ha escuchado, en la de inglés, ¿verdad? En la de Facebook. <ríe> ya. <ríe> ya. Damas y caballeros, sean todos. and gentlemen, welcome to all of you to this second convention from Agro Mining Academy 2021 virtual platform. We would like to greet all of you that are connected from different cities in Peru. And of course, this virtuality that allows us to be connected through the whole world. We would like to thank all of you once again. And then we are going to have three very intensive days. Our conferences, both in Spanish, Quechua, and English, in a permanent way, for which you will have the possibility to have a very heterogeneous uh, audience. It is an honor to have the presence of the distinguished authorities that are here today in this opening session of the second Agromining Convention, Agromining 2021 Virtual Platform. I am going to invite them. We have with us Mr. Oscar Maurtua, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Jorge Luis Chavez, uh, Vice Minister of Mines from the Ministry of Energy and Mines, Mr. Juan Manuel Garcia Calderón, General Director of TechSU, Engineer Raúl Araya, Manager of Energy Mines and Hydrocarbons of the Region La Libertad, and Engineer Romulo Mucho, President of Agromin, and Executive Director of the Civil Association Agrominera del Perú. To begin this session formally with this very important event, 
We are going to give the floor to the Mayor Romulo Muncho, President of Agromit and Executive Director of the Civil Association Agraminera of Peru. Welcome, Engineer Muncho. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And to the excellent, excellent authorities, to Mr. Oscar Maur, to a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Jorge Luis Chavez, Vice Minister of Mines, at the Ministry of Energy and Mines, Mr. Raul Araya, Manager of Energy Mines and Hydrocarbons of La Libertad Region, Mr. Juan Manuel Garcia Calderon, General Director of the Express of our Organizing Committee, ladies and gentlemen. To all the participants of the second edition of Agromin, Agriculture and Mining United by Nature, I am honored to have the opening words for the development of this event today, Thursday and Friday, in your virtual platform. This morning, we are gathered to talk about mining and agriculture, two important sectors for our country. On these activities, we know a lot, but a little at the same time. Why? Because those who are working in both activities, we know how they develop the technology that is applied, the good practices that are implemented uh, on an ongoing basis in the company. And we know that both vectors can live together and develop fully in the same territory. But still, a significant number of Peruvians know very little about its operator. The social investment in the reference zones, the contributions of the industry to overcome the challenges of the market. That is why that Agromin is a pioneering event that focus on these two sectors has become a sector with a responsible position, with technical and approach that looks for providing solutions, technical and social solutions for both sectors, because Peru is an agro-mining country. Since the first edition, we set an important milestone in the history of the country. I am sure that our experience will be applied in South America. We are a mining country with resources that provides or that is essential to the world. And we, at the same time, are an agricultural country. So both activities are boosting the growth in the country and therefore it is important for them to develop together without any problems. Let's remember that agriculture and mining represent around 20% of the GDP. This gives us competitive advantages with other countries that do not have such a diversity. To strengthen the economic activities will be the boost for Peru to continue developing. We have the chance to use those competitive advantages based on the matrix of national development, promoting the best practices, the proper management of water, and the respect to the environment, the responsibility, social responsibility with our communities, and also to generate new investments that will put Peru in the first world to be part of the sustainable sustainment development goals. We also in mining, in addition to mining, we support mining, fishing, tourism, gastronomy, and the forest activity, the earnings and the good use. It will be possible to access to the technology of the fourth industrial revolution, so we are not left behind. It is important to overcome the prejudices and paradigms and the support incompatibility between mining and agriculture. The, our task is to help about the recent uh, events in the country that affect specifically the mining sector. I call for the dialogue that is the best tool for understanding. The officials of the government, we should be more aware of technical issues. And in this meeting, we will get together first level specialists and the entrepreneurs of the agricultural and mining sector to look for a synergy that is co compatible and necessary. There are good practices in the sector. In Agromin, we wanted to show them and we contacted with an important program of uh, transfers that 
through which you will learn about success cases and good practices between both sectors. Agromin would not be possible without the support from the committee, the organizing committee, as well as the support of the entities such as the Ministry of Energy and Mines and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In addition to the permanent contribution of embassies, commercial offices of the countries that have joined this objective since last year on a permanent basis. Welcome to all our speakers, panel members, moderators, sponsors, exhibitors, the press, and the leaders of the communities, teachers, students, and general audience. Thank you very much for the of agro-mining, agro-mining 21. Hay en Campucuy, está hecho un Sky Kuti Convención, Agromín 2021. Incuiman a Paripuchanta, Internet, Chaupimanta, Pacho. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the second Agromín Convention, Agromín 2021. This event will be fully transmitted through virtual platforms. Thank you so much. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, ingeniero Romulo. Mucho, ingeniero, mucho por este interesting message, opening message, en este evento que fue algo que todos estaban esperando por, y debido a la current situación, por eso nos hace una plataforma virtual. Y también mencionaste inglés y quechua, que son las dos lenguas que with which all the events will be translated. This is a very important fact that we need to highlight. Thank you very much, Ingenier So we will be uh, sharing with you here in this event. So now we are going to receive Mr. Juan Manuel Garcia Calderón, who is the General Director of Exud, the official seat of the Agromin platform. We were talking about the virtual means and yes, we have who represent uh, the virtuality in this event. Good morning, Mr. Juan Manuel Garcia Calderón. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of TechSoup, we would like to welcome you to this second convention, Agromin 2021. I remember that we were the host of the first convention in our campus in the city of Trujillo. Well, now, we are very pleased uh, to receive you in this second edition through our digital platform that in this second convention we will be able to exchange ideas and experiences to strengthen the development of communities in harmony with all the operations. In this way, we are going to set the grounds for a sustainable growth. We send our warm greetings on behalf of TechSoup to all the authorities that are here with us and also to Romulo Mucho and also Raul Araya, the manager of energy, the minister, Vice Minister Jorge Luis Chavez and Minister Oscar Maurtua. We reiterate the welcome to all the companies and to all the authorities and participants. We hope that this second convention will meet the objectives. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for your message, Mr. Garcia Calderón. And now we are going to listen to the word of Ingenier Raul Araya, the manager of energy mines and hydrocarbons of La Libertad region. Good morning, Ingenier Raul Araya. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation of our governor. And he apologizes because uh, he, had, he was not present at this time because he had some issues. But I'm sure that during the conference he will be participating. This morning, I would like to, to greet Ingenier Romulo Mucho. And, uh, uh, President of Agromin, Mr. Juan Manuel Garcia, Director of TechSoup, and also to our Minister, Eduardo González, Dr. Maita, Minister of Agriculture, and Mr. Oscar Maurto, Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
as we all know, all over the country, almost in all regions, the activity of mining and metallic and non-metallic ores, and also the activities of agriculture. We know that mining starts with the exploration, then the transformation of resources, metallic and non-metallic products, which are essential inputs for a large variety of industries for the manufacturing of inputs. In our region, we are positioned as one of the main regions in the country in the mining sector because of the advantages in front of other activities. Mining is much more profitable than any other activity. However, in our sector, we could have a threat if we do not make a correct reading of the current social needs that we are facing in the country at present. Currently, we know that there are social conflicts uh, belong to the mining sector and we should not overlook that. These social conflicts are related to several environmental and social issues. Maybe this is an opportunity to reflect and to look for solutions. The mining activity uh, invests in technologies for a fundamental development of uh, sustainable activities in the environment. We see a high percentage of peasant uh, communities base their activities in agriculture and livestock, and therefore there is an impact on their work. So this could create a feeling of impact or invasion into their areas where they are developing their activities for many years. That is why our region, we are convinced that the productive alliance between mining and agriculture will benefit with, with the innovation and competitiveness. So it is a good thing that spaces, uh, meetings like the one today for the agro mining uh, activities in the virtual platform will enable us and to have the same path to work in a coordinated way, uh, living with agriculture and mining, always respecting our environment and our sectors. So thank you to everyone. Good morning to everyone. And a big hug from the distance. Thank you. For this message in general, Araya, and we think that it is necessary at present to have the north do this three-day intensive day with a large amount of specialists that will be talking about these two fundamental topics for the country. Thank you for your message. Now, we are going to invite Jorge Luis Chavez, Vice Minister of Mines at the Ministry of Energy and Mines, for his message. Good morning, Dr. Jorge Luis Chavez. Welcome. Estamos con algunos problemas de conexión. We have some connection issues. The next guest, Dr. Jorge Luis Chávez Presa, Vice Minister of Mines at the Ministry of Energy and Mines. We are trying to get in touch with him. And we will try once more, but meanwhile, we are going to listen to the message from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Oscar Mautia. You have the floor. Oh, 
Oscar Maurto has sent us a message for this opening session. We are going to share it with you so kindly. Those who are joining us with the technical support to share the message that was sent by the Minister Oscar Maurto. While you prepare the message, we are going to thank very especially those who are the sponsors, but some of the sponsors that uh, of our meeting in this second convention. We would like to thank very especially Ingeniero Romulo Mucho already mentioned some of them. We would like to thank Sponsors, Southern Peru Copper Corporation, the branch in Peru, Sociedad Minera Cerro Verde, and our collaborators, the Association for the Sustainable Agricultural Development, Mindy Apoderosa, Consortium from Catalina, the British Embassy, Ferreiros, Avis Peru, Ipexa, Matusani Yellow Extract. Minsu, Ontali, Pinera y Anacot, Newman, and the mining company Antamina. To all of them, we would like to thank them especially. And through this event, we will know different collaborators, media partners, and others that are supporting this event and how important they are for us at this moment. Now we do have the possibility to receive Dr. Jorge Luis Chavez by the Chair of Mines at the Ministry of Energy and Mines. Welcome. Thank you for your time in this opening session. Welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to see convention of agriculture and mining, whose date will be between November 24 and 26 in the virtual platform. I would like to thank the organizers of this event. In the second agro-mining convention for your invitation, especially to Engineer Romulo Mucho, who Engineer Eduardo Gonzalez Todo, who has stated several occasions his commitment with the support of a mining, modern mining that is responsible and sustainable, but in the social phase, in the benefit of the development of our peoples. In the Ministry of Energy and Mines, we are convinced that mining and or the mining investment can live together perfectly with agriculture and with any other productive activity. If the established standards have been are complied with in a strict manner, uh, res uh, respecting our water sources and the respect to the peoples located within the area of operations and development of the mining activity. So in these days, you will hear about successful living together between mining and agriculture, as well as the synergies that have been achieved on the basis of dialogue and consensus between companies and our communities. Social conflict that we see day after day and that they are being heard by this government are the consequence, and I say this very respectfully, of an abandonment that we are trying to solve in a definite way in spaces that will gather the state because it is the responsibility 
the space that gathers also the companies and our civil society formed by communities around these investments, where decisions, technical decisions, and agreed decisions will be made adjusted to the law. In order to achieve this objective, this type of meetings are very important, like agromin that boost uh, the relationship between the agricultural and mining sector to find responses to the environmental challenges and social challenges that we find in the way to a higher economic growth, but especially to a higher human growth. It is the time to think that our people should have this development that belongs to them by law. Our mining is an ally, of course it is, and it has reached a very progressive and strong recovery after the pandemic impact. All the actions were carried out, so this activity did not stop and did not affect our economy. In the first 10 months of the year, there was a record figure in the transfer of resources generated by our mining activity. The regional governments and local governments received that. And there is a commitment for that investment of about uh, 6.5 billion would reach and be fed populations around the mining investment. This figure exceeds by 56.9% the total resources generated. These mining transfers include the canon, royalties, and the right of validity and penalty are an important source of funding for executing public projects that generate employment. But that development of public projects has to be seen and it has to be within the environment of development of our peoples. And then agriculture is a very important element because most of the geographical areas where this activity takes place, we have agri agricultural and livestock activity. Therefore, I think it is an obligation of this forum to see the generation of employment that will improve the life quality and will improve also the opportunities of our citizens in this as well as the irrigation works for, to strengthen our agricultural areas in the direct employment in our mining we also have reached historical figures in september with the inclusion of 221,680 workers last week we were talking with our Sister Republic of Ecuador, and we see that our figures have made a lot of impact. And they want to have some similarity in the type of development of activities in the labor aspect of our workers that work in this mining sector. And these 220 workers do not include the indirect jobs generated by this activity because we all know that although it is a it is true that there is a given number of workers, the productive cycle expands eight times more. At the level of investments between January and September, an investment of $3 billion was made, and we saw a peak, an important peak at the level of production and exports. Having said so, ladies and gentlemen, the government, of Mr. President Pedro Castillo and the management of the sector at the Ministry of Energy and Mines, led by engineer Eduardo Gonzalez Odo, are looking for a higher mining development and more investment in our mining. And we believe that working all the actors, state, companies and our community with transparency, with commitment, with honesty, and with a lot of responsibility, we will be able to set the ground for the necessary changes. 
always looking for the solution of the fair complaints of populations that have been postponed in their development, complying the social commitment taken by the state and by the companies, respecting the culture, the traditions, but most of all, respecting the environment and building a climate of calm, of social peace, projecting an attractive scenario for our investments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be present in this forum called Second Agro Mining Convention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chavez Resta, for important message for giving us uh, some time in your very busy agenda. Let's listen to the message. Les pedimos, por favor, si pueden colocar el audio, porque no se está pudiendo escuchar. We are solving this technical problem. Vamos a poder escuchar del ministro Oscar Maurtua, quien te envió su lista de the message of Minister Oscar Maurtua, who will be in charge of giving the opening word. Thank you to all of you for being with us, and we are going to begin. We will have marked the topic. We will be having speakers and panelists in a little while we're going to tell you now we do have the message let's listen to it Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, mining and agriculture have been and will continue being fundamental activities for the economic development of Peru, offering opportunities for investment, both for national businessmen and foreign businessmen. We have seen progress in the performance of the agricultural and mining sector. Their development still has potential challenges and potential. So I congratulate the Civil Association Agrominera for the, for the organization of this event that groups the public and private sector to have a joint dialogue and precisely on the opportunities offered by both sectors, as well as to discuss the challenges and possibilities to optimize the competitiveness. I would like to highlight in this space topics related to sustainable development of resources, the promotion of technology in productive processes, the prevention of social conflicts, among other topics, relevant topics. I am certain that the exchange of ideas and experiences will contribute to formulate strategies and public policies that will ensure a sustainable and responsible production with the environment, with society and the workers in a special context like the one of the economic reactivation post-pandemic. In the context of the reactivation of economy, we should pay special attention to the activities in agriculture and mining 
due to the high impact that they have in the national development, in the generation of employment, and therefore in the improvement of the living quality of people, including especially those that are the most vulnerable. In 2021, mining employed in a direct way more than 241,000 people, consolidating as a progress tool for many Peruvian families. In the near future, the portfolio of projects in the sector amounts to $56 billion, will create opportunities, economic opportunities for entrepreneurs, exporters, scientists, and technical experts and workers. Likewise, the global production depends from the mining activity, sending our natural resources like gold, lead, silver, among others, and the exportation so far in 2021 has increased by 73 0.3% compared to the same period last year. We wait with expectation and trust that the value of lithium in our Altiplano will also be included. On the other hand, the agriculture is another essential economic sector for Peru and for many other countries that benefit from our abundant production, our family, an entrepreneurial family employs millions of Peruvians, ensuring the food safety and the nutrition of our society with a positive impact on the quality of life of adults and children, men and women. We add to this the entrepreneurial spirit of the agricultural Peruvian sector that's supported by the FTA subscribed by Peru consolidated us as leaders in the export of agricultural products like quinoa, asparagus, avocado, coffee, cacao, among other products. In this way, in the past two decades, the value of our agro export has grown more than 10 times. In the way to the economic sustainable recovery of our country, we must provide renewed attention to the mining and agricultural sectors, looking for the complementarity in our territory in order to have a harmonious uh, union free of conflict. We all Peruvians should be aware of this. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemics show that the most sustainable companies are those that have a better management in the face of risks and adversities, contributing to the sustainability of the environment and to a fairer society. In this way, they will get higher profitability and better opportunities, business opportunities. That is why the government of President Pedro Castillo uh, mentions the criteria of social profit projects made by the private sector. This should contribute to the local, regional, and national economy, improving the quality of employment for all the workers and producing specific results, tangible results, in the benefit of all Peruvians, especially of the ones that are the most vulnerable. In this objective, the the state is an ally generating an investment environment for providing legal stability and macroeconomic stability. The goal is that in 2021 the economy will grow more than 11% and that in 2022 more than 5%, which will send us as a country of big opportunities, highlighting our image as one of the strongest solid markets in the region, and fostering the trust among the investors. I would like to finish this intervention, ladies and gentlemen, reiterating the commitment of the Foreign Affairs Ministry with the reactivation, the economic sustainable reactivation focused on key sectors like mining and agriculture. 
whose development will impact in the life quality of our citizens, especially those that are the most vulnerable, with an inclusive, solidarity vision and obviously a productive uh, vision from the Foreign Affairs Minister and through our diplomatic offices abroad, we will be providing support to the national entrepreneurs and we will continue disseminating the big opportunities offered by the agricultural and mining sector in Peru. In, in, this, in this occasion, initiatives as Agromin are very important. Uh, today we are going to see a future vision and practical spirit and a very creative spirit. I I hope I wish you all of all of you a very fruitful working day. Thank you very much. Well thank you to the Minister Oscar Maurya and for this message. who have joined us uh, with their messages. Okay. Of the opening session of AgroMean 2021 virtual platform. In this way, we open, we are going to take a picture. Thank you of turning on your cameras. Thanking you for your time. Eh, y de muchas actividades eh, de cada uno de, de ustedes, así que queremos agradecerles esa deferencia que han tenido para acompañarnos eh, y con sus mensajes. sumamente provechosas que esperamos. start this is three hard working days. Thank you. Thank you for your support, for your participation. We will invite you all to stay connected and to join us throughout these three days of conference. Now we will start in with the specific sessions uh, for today's agenda. So we will be starting with the conference topics and our platform, you will be able to visit the technological fair where you will be going through a three round of different stands. You will also get the chance to get to know the winners. And we also have a business round table where you will have different meetings with companies and businesses, all the different options that you will find in our platform. Agromin keeps on focusing on education, so we will have such a wonderful Thank you again. The different authorities we will ask you to turn off your videos and become participants in this first session. I will now give the floor to the moderator for the session, but first of all, I will explain. Cien que tenemos traducción al quechua y al inglés en la parte de abajo. For those of you who have just connected, you have a world icon where you will have interpretation preferred language. This is important to know because we will have sometimes speakers in different languages. At this first topic, we have mining and agriculture. 50 years from now, moderator for this session will be Dr. Calso, which is an ex vice minister of Mines of Peru. He's a lawyer of the Catholic University, Jack University master degree holder. He has worked as a lawyer in different firms in the U.S. In international, he's a regional corporation uh, and pro inversion. He is executive member of the Australia Chamber, and currently 
he's been working on the public sector. He's a speaker and several conference and strategic consultant on businesses and projects. He's part of the consulting committee of Agromin and the Espomin conference as well. Good morning, Dr. Uh, Augusto Cauti, our first moderator for this session. Uh, thank you, Paola, for the introduction. Greetings to all of you who are uh, following us through the different platforms of Agromin. After this first opening session, we will try to focus on the first topic of the day, mining and agriculture, 50 years from now. As you may notice from the title already, we're trying to look at the different trends in the future. And you need to actually look at uh, what the trends would look like. And the opportunities that we may have is countries around the world and specifically for Peru for these two specific economic sectors, which is agriculture and mining. Alna will now present the speakers and panel members. Juan Manuel Benitez, the president of the Third Institute. He studied economics in Pacific University and the Catholic University of Chile. He is executive director of Agro Rural, Vice Ministry of Rural Development and Irrigation and Minister of that same place as well. He also worked in the Ministry of Economy of Peru and his uh, IDB consultant, CAF consultant, UNDP, among other different international agencies. And he has been also a teacher of and professor of Peru and the Cayetano University. He has been also a Currently, President of Cresar Institute, I just, as I just said, William Vivanco, he's a professor of uh, La Molina Granarian University, and he, he's a specialist on anime reproduction. He has a PhD of the Magrara University, and he's a technical director of Vivanco Internal SAC. He has worked as scientific at the international and international level, and he has been supporting peasant communities in the Andes and the production of livestock uh, worldwide. He has held several speeches worldwide, and we also have Manuel Vieira, who is the president of the Mining Chamber of Chile has an economist and the an civil engineering. He is a managing partner of MetaProject Chile, MetaProject Peru. On uh, certified mining resources in MetaProject Peru. And as I said, he's uh, the president of the Mining Chamber of Chile. His panel members, Alfonso Velasquez, he is the engineer from the Uni University. He also has a Masters of Monterrey, Mexico, and he is a consultant who also studied in Salamanca University. He is the executive president of Sierra Selva Explotadora, and he has been a former president of the member of uh, processing company Arex, and he has uh, worked uh, in Juntos as well president of others among other different management positions. He is currently a founder member of Procesadora Peru and Augusto Berti. He is the current president of Chapi Committee Consulting. He is the president of the Board of Directors of Panorama Minerals. He is a member of Panorama Minerals and FIME. He is a president and member of the different associations of mining companies in Peru, and he has been a former director of the FPM, the um, 
Mining Association of Peru and the Peruvian Canadian Chamber of Commerce. He has been also president of Atlas Copco, Petro Peru, and Gagne Montero. After this thorough introduction, I will ask the first uh, keynote speakers to uh, start with, and after that, we will have the panel session. Let's start with Juan, Juan Manuel Benitez, please. Good morning to all of you. Do you need, do I need to project my own PPT, right? Okay. When I was asked to make this presentation, as Augusto said, it is not an easy job. Um, of course, how to think on a new trend to try to make this sort of mix in between what the vision would look like in from 50 years from now on until what the reality at this uh, present day, whether we will move towards the right or a different direction and how will that uh, road will look like. So I call my presentation Agriculture um, from 50 years from now, opportunities in the crisis. I think um, the rule is not the session to the rule. Uh, since we uh, may probably have just a few minutes, I will try to summarize and emphasize a specific topics, especially um, I will focus on public policies and I will ask this first question. What is climate change to you? Or I think, how are we ambitioning the future of the world, of, of humankind? Probably this is one of the questions and reflections that we may have. What will happen in 50 years from now because of climate change impacts? We have just held a COP uh, lately. So maybe there are uh, some uh, people that may not be that conservative or they might be more concerned on uh, climate issues. So you could probably think on the end of humankind, if we keep on doing what uh, we have been doing so far, we'll get up to the end. The apocalypse is the end of life as we know it. And maybe that they may be right up to some extent if we look at the different in initiatives and therefore we have governments and authorities held in meetings like the COP but I would like to look at it uh, in a pessimistic uh, lens and look at the opportunities of improvement to look at the future and see how this climate change that is calling the attention of all of us, not only politicians, but all of us uh, citizens from the youngest in our households to the oldest. How can we probably include these reflections into our agendas? Peru will be probably one of the most affected countries uh, impacted by climate change, but it is also a country that has great room for opportunity since we have this huge uh, rainforest area and biodiversity that, that may help uh, to mitigate climate change. So we have both sides of the coin either. We will say, oh, how can we attract the attention of other countries to help us to move throughout this crisis or we see it as an opportunity so that we can say, yes, uh, here we are, these are our assets. How, how can we support and cooperate? How can I provide some sort of input for the climate change agenda? And this is probably something that may start with this whole land organization on the priorities at the political level. Therefore, this image is showing how do we think on this park of life? One of my friends used to call and use this term, this park of life where you will know exactly where everything is located, where is agriculture, where are forests, where are industries, where can we live all together without confrontation? And that's a point that I would like to go through in detail, just to build a unity instead of looking at divisions that may probably um, do not necessarily follow a, any specific ideology. When you think on the context, you need to think on two main points the scarcity of water on the one hand, 
uh, say that glaciers uh, will probably disappear with less than 30 percent and we won't necessarily have enough capacity of retaining waters in our oceans because of that increase uh, and especially if people inhabitants of the highlands will probably migrate migrate to uh, other areas and we may also have another interconnected impact the loss of forests probably the driver for reforestation deforestations are not the main industry for oil palm and cocoa which are definitely present in that area but family agriculture is also impacting uh, so basically small producers trying to look for future they move to the rainforest areas they want to work on practical practices on soils that may not necessarily is that productive therefore they need to migrate and look for better places for agricultural purposes or they may probably also focus on coca plantation which are quite productive but illegal for sure and that is linked to other illegal activities as well so we need to think on what to do in order to face this water scarcity especially in the coastline how do we efficiently manage water how we harvest water how we save them and protect these water resources and how do we recycle Technified irrigation is key. That is a need for a national irrigation system nationwide. I was uh, watching a documentary on eco and scarcity of water, and at the end, you will thank God. Well, you will stop exporting it, which was, of course, the wrong conclusion after watching that documentary. But basically, the idea will be different, probably. How when we can work together with Juan Cabelica to try to work on a basin management in order to control that how to work with synergies in between modern and traditional agriculture the same applies with the forest in the forest we also need to think that if we are probably always looking at the agro industry as a main driver especially the oil palm industry which represents one percent of the land or less 0.1 percent of the deforested areas but it's being called the main driver without looking at the coca production which is going to be mostly located in these areas is basically no Kayali uh, but on the opposite we need to try to link agribusiness with the more producers and value chain connections so that they could stop this huge impact is deforestation so we may have a crisis or an opportunity if we look at these two scenarios we need to think on what to do in order to produce more food use the water resources but try to also capture carbon throughout a more a smart agriculture a sustainable agriculture and I will talk about that later on climate change should not impact all of us at the same level of course the those uh, small farmers poor farmers are the ones that are uh, strongly impacted when we talk about the second agrarian reform you think on a proposal of public policies to, for the least favored nobody could probably reject it but when you really actually read the proposal i think they went to the, the wrong way if you are thinking of um, more than public procurement or technical assistance for production without connection with the market or without channels um, and, and you have infrastructure what we will create is probably an over demand or a exclusive dependency on production on public procurement processes which may not necessarily be the right path that could probably lead to very dangerous expectations without uh, spending too much time in here let's look at how agriculture also has uh, been seriously impacted and it also impacts productivity which creates this huge huge uh, problems and pressures that it also has the natural resources as well we also have gender gender which plays an important role on agriculture there's a less technical assistance and you need to rethink on how to use the role of women which has a different perspective 
a sustainable uh, view of resources and, uh, and and maybe look ahead and the projection of uh, how households can be reinforced. I think those two items that we also need to include in our public policy. What will happen in the future with our agriculture? We have a huge market, 10 million of inhabitants by 2015 that will be eating every day and asking for fresh, organic food, uh, sustainable on time with higher standards of sustainability. They are asking for the traceability of the produce and how, when they produce it, with which standard qualities and equity. So definitely, I believe that Peru is a far beyond uh, productivity levels compared to other countries, but uh, we may pro create significant changes if we could place ourselves as uh, one of the main producers of this type of products. Developed countries have forgotten about the land. People have migrated to the main cities, the big cities, and they are probably increasing the service um, sector and forgotten about agriculture. And we see that uh, in the North Hemisphere, they definitely suffer from huge climate uh, stream conditions. The South Ramis here do experience also these issues, but we have less uh, inhabitants. So we definitely have an opportunity to reach greater, larger markets, and maybe our advantages we have land, we have water, we're missing technology, and we need to connect uh, to this long-term view that will work for the connections in between family farmers with uh, great agriculture. I've heard in so many times the uh, export uh, agriculture has uh, made life complicated by family agriculture producers, on the contrary, those are two different uh, markets and areas. Yes, the, the, the law on um, agricultural promotion has uh, um, helped, uh, and I will show those numbers later on, and the, there's a positive impact, but also family production, uh, have maybe not as much as modern agriculture, but if we look at this, uh, the different way, if we look at the market productivity, not this whole looking at the government and asking what uh, you can give to me, but to not just simply give a, the place of a person that want to work uh, as a producer somewhere that will definitely have a positive in the long run. Why agriculture can be a priority? Because it contributes to the growth of the economy and it creates job opportunities. There's no doubt of it. It, it probably some uh, seven points to the GDP is key for the sustainability on time, a driver for our growth. In these are quick numbers, I already said 7% of our GDP, but we have uh, also 57% of economic rural activity. Agriculture in the rural areas is the main activity. We need to look at the opportunity and the impact that must have. On, on issues such as the news that we have been listening in, in the past few days, in the rural area, we cannot talk about the economy between mining and agriculture. Both agriculture and mining have to come together. Whenever there's a mining site, of course, it has to follow environmental procedures, but it has to be seen as a blessing because of the benefits, economic benefits, but also for human resources made it feasible, possible to track other investments to these uh, areas, reduce risk, creating basic 
infrastructure, such as the process of the uh, works for taxes program that allows this dynamism in the region. Not everywhere, yes, that's true, but it should not only be an effort of the private sector, but it should be a public and private effort, therefore synergies in between mining and agriculture supported by the government that believes in the private sector and that, that do not uh, hinder it. Uh, let's uh, talk about the agricultural sector in inspection that diversifies the Peruvian economy. Together with the mining, it is the second main source of uh, income. Definitely, we can grow even further due to the international demand. This growth will reduce poverty. We reduce 40% of poverty in rural areas there where agriculture activities are held. When we heard an analysis uh, on the export boom and people suggest that there were no benefits for the population, I just wonder whether they are looking at uh, what type of statistics. Uh, of course, if you say that there was a reduction of poverty, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It is the economy and the connection in between modern export agriculture that uh, provide a ground for it because uh, I mean, export is uh, working together in projects in Ayacucho, Ancash, in other areas of Moquegua, which are closely linking small producers to large value change through uh, the whole export system. So how do we actually include more exporters to this good value chain and not to start from zero from scratch and, and look always at this division between poor and rich we all we all not to probably well, even richer and richer agriculture is based on the uh, food security in this country the pandemic 2019 has shown us the importance of food we were able to in our country and we definitely need to thank uh, family agriculture which has supported us it should not only uh, be uh, recognized but uh, su more support is needed agrarian reform the second agrarian reform has quite interesting concepts that may be applicable to other things that need to be fine-tuned but we need to work on food sovereignty and security because Peru actually needs to cover uh, that demand to grow and it not only goes through a food serenity and uh, maybe I may probably have some questions on food serenity. Food serenity feels like only eating our production but I think that the freedom, the freedom of the market and of people uh, uh, will need to take into consideration therefore an open economy is needed not only to benefit our exports but also hacemos que tengamos agricultura más productiva que pueda devolverle tierra a la naturaleza, que no necesitemos tantas tierras, que por hectáreas seamos mucho más capaces de crear más valor. Right. 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 How do you manage this resource manager? So we should not divide mining and agriculture. Mining and agriculture uses the same basin, uses the same water resources, and mining uses less water than agriculture. So how do we sum up? How do we protect 
water resources, how mining through the resources so they create and protect and strengthen agriculture as well. How do we share this concern in order to solve these issues? And of course, you need to think that this is different and it does not only mean the change of solution, but mostly on how to look at the challenges, the challenges by uh, including uh, strategies on territorial development, sustainable and inclusion. How do we use natural resources in a more efficient way? All activities need to be balanced and we need to define them with a broader participation, not with ideology, with technical support, not just because I don't like it or I don't feel it appropriate. We need to have scientific ground. We need to know exactly how to use those resources and how to benefit all, most of Peruvians by more, with more equity to attract private investment that could create synergies with the mining. Other sources of investment could come. There is a more structure uh, in, at the regional level that will also be useful. Other different activities, modern agriculture could probably find in the mining industry a partner to work uh, together on a value chain through funding, for instance improving productivity on traditional agricultural systems. They have water, good soil, traditional knowledge, the technology that we require has to come and, and be available to increase those uh, productivity levels, but always oriented towards the market. You need to look at uh, these uh, different way of uh, looking at things. You were looking at the, the specific plot? No, no. You have to be productive, but you're looking at the market and who is going to buy that product. Are you concerned on how much will that we get for that specific production? Increasing of production at the plot level will create any sort of surplus. Are you looking at this portfolio of products for the future? Well, we may probably need to look at this and should not only be firefighters uh, just extinguishing fires when they come. No, we need to look ahead. We need to plan ahead for the future for the global markets and let's therefore work on more smart initiatives and sustainable natural resource uh, sustainable management. We need to talk sit together and analyze with a specific ground what is needed, what are the solutions that we can achieve. It is not just simply a, a specific social address that will need to define the life of a mining cycle or a, a specific change in the mining regulation. We need to look at the, the statistical view. We need to work as public servants and sometimes we forget about it and in order to end this presentation, I just want to focus on the challenge. Global food security is an opportunity for us. We have a captive market, growing market, a huge demand for an economy. This is a blessing. Peru is the country, is a, a country with export and agricultural background. Nature has blessed us with biodiversity. So we need to focus on this huge, uh, large food produce production, possibility productivity. Climate change could be a challenge or a possibility. It, it gives us a possibility to uh, enhance our profits if we get up to a different level of technological progress, all the different changes that we need to want harvest of water, work on the coastline, and also land organization, a smart agriculture, wherever it is needed, so we can give us a label of sustainable country that will achieve awards in the, due to the good uh, products that could be sent to more developed economies, and that will probably come together with the results of the last COP. The 
availability of financial resources. But it is not just simply to sit there and say, okay, I want resources to work on resilience and mitigation measures. That is not uh, the idea. We need to provide proposals. We need to say, we have this number of factors with resilience, with sustainability, proposals with low emissions with uh, reduced uh, water um, re resource management. Basically, how can I feed the world with equity? This is the agenda that we need to place in discussion. This is the agenda we've been calling for, for this government and the coming ones and how to manage resources. Something that I forget to mention that will be probably part of one presentation is how to manage and that, and that will be something that we need to talk about and um, decentralization not only to provide financial resources but a, a smart vision and how to work on projects such as DPMOs uh, with accountability closer to the um, population with more transparency so not just simply having this brainstorming but basically to put them into practice what to do to communicate with opportunity so climate change is there but let's uh, not look at the catastrophe but look at it as an opportunity the uh, strategies have to be uh, interconnected uh, in looking at the development of a specific area let's uh, Forget about our fear on um, planning. We are not in the 70s or 60s. It is a very different way of decentralization. So we need to look at the prospection of uh, the PPPs beyond the government. Uh, and let's uh, look at uh, the uh, more agile um, and comprehensive approach. It's very different view of working on decentralization. Let's try to attract resources by presenting a specific agenda, proposal, uh, with uh, sustainability, uh, creating an, a new brand, n no, not only superfood, but sustainable superfoods, for instance, to generate resources uh, and protect uh, natural resources. Uh, also, looking at the global citizen uh, with resilience, inclusion, respect of human rights, if you ask me, what will be the future for Peru and what will happen in the next 50 years? The best way to predict the future is building that future. And that's exactly what probably our soccer team, I hope at least, is uh, doing to be part of the next World Championship. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Manuel. Thank you for your presentation. So thank you. Uh, now we will be Banco, please. Thank you to the organ to the organizing committee. I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. We have to talk. To talk about mining and agriculture and the challenges to the future are based on the increase of human population. Considering the effects of COVID, it is expected that by 2070, we will have 45 million Peruvian citizens. That means that in these 50 years, the population will have increased by 50%. That means that we need to increase the availability of food for the population at least by 50%, considering minimum per capita consumption. But we know in many areas this, is, this has a deficit like malnutrition in children, etc. If we reach the proper nutrition levels, the demand for food is going to increase in about 80% on the current level. This uh, population increase will not only demand more goods, more services, 
more housing, etc. Not only food. The, that is a lot of pressure thinking about the future and the demand of food and services will increase. As a consequence of that demographic explosion that we are going to face in the next 50 years, there is going to be an incre increase in the green ga gas greenhouse gases and in consequences uh, the climate change that has already been presented. Another problem is that the land that is used to produce food and to build the cities, it is causing the disappearance of forests and the wildlife reserves because the population is taking more and more land because they need it for development. Lower water availability, loss of soils, salinization, genetic erosion, more than 4,000 varieties uh, disappear every year. And then we will see a very dramatic reduction in, among the rural population, which leads to a higher concentration of people in the cities. In Peru, by 2050, there will be like 86% people living in the cities, at present we have about 50%. And all of that is a pressure on all the services, food, transportation, and so on and so forth. And there is going to be a significant increase in energy needs. More population, more demand of energy. This is what is going to happen in the next 50 years. So our challenges are how to decrease the production of greenhouse gases, the fall of uh, trees in the forest, and the loss of the wildlife. How can we avoid the environmental pollution and the genetic erosion? How to produce enough food that will be nutritional and will be available to all the population. Uh, we have to ensure the availability of water for cities, for the fields, for the industry. Uh, preserve the soil, produce non-polluting energy, and to make an efficient distribution of that energy, optimizing the rational use of energy. And the most fundamental point is to be able to make the man understand that man is responsible of the continuity of life in this planet. These challenges show a fundamental task. We need to rationalize the use of the land and to return the land to the natural reserves and the wildlife I agree with Sir David Hackenberg. He's an English athlete, very famous, and he says that to the extent that we return the land to the wildlife, we will decrease the environmental pollution. We need to restructure the communities and we have to stop the atomization of the rural property, eradicate the illegal mining activities, develop the formal mining uh, in symbiosis with agriculture, intensify agriculture in the existing lands that are already working in agriculture. And we need to innovate the technology and we have to generate new systems for agricultural production. We are working with agricultural systems that have not changed in thousands of years. We have to save the water and use it efficiently, intensify the harvesting of water, 
and also to increase the productive efficiency of crops and breeding, develop and use the renewable energy, and educate man as a fundamental element in the conservation of the environment and in the optimization of the use of resources. <laughs> in this document of CEPLAN, there is this information. They talk about the potential use and the present use of land in agriculture. In the coast, you see the current use is lower than the potential use. So, I possibilities to develop irrigation channels for agriculture. Similar situation in the jungle. However, in the highlands, the current use it's double than the potential use. And similar thing happens in livestock. The use of livestock in the soils of Peru. We are using 15 instead of 10.58, so we need to rationalize that for the use of the soil. Here is a picture from Apurimac, we can see the desertification in the natural prairies in the high Andes. They are located up to 5,000 meters above sea level. This should be turned into management of natural reserves. In agriculture, in this picture, you can see this terrain that is being cultivated in a vertical slope. So this is going to be wasted. Peru is the, it's one of the most deforested countries in the world. Well, it would be good for this would be happening for production of food. But, no, that's not the situation. The desertification, the deforestation, is made for illegal activities, and coca, growing crops, smuggling of timber, and illegal mining. This informal or illegal mining destroys both the agriculture and the national reserves of flora and wildlife, and it threatens human health. So we need to formalize mining that will enable to avoid the destruction of the environment and to have more economic resources for the development of the rural communities, not to give job and sustain these communities. So the community so that the communities will develop culture and mining. And they also have to be ready for when the mine is not there. They should not depend only on the mines. They should depend on their own activities. Regarding the technology, there was intensive work all over the world. For instance, there are some technological advancements in agriculture, urban agriculture. I think that is one of the most interesting alternatives looking into the future. And this 40-story building, it has hydroponic uh, intervention. Large quantities of food can be produced. Without the need of transportation, distribution, even more if 80% of people will be living in the cities. This is a building in Switzerland, 30 floors, uh, they produce vegetables. They have an uh, intensive design to produce uh, forage. 
and with 100 square meters of hydroponic uh, crops, we can release 25 hectares of field and in energy. Both Australia and the United States are developing in the class, the windows of the buildings. They will be transformers of solar energy. All the power needs of the building for buildings, for housing, and factories, or urban farms. And now we have an extraordinary instrument that is the molecular and biology. This is the fundamental tool for this century to face the challenges of food, preservation of genetic resources, productivity increase, and productive sustainability with the environment. The modern biotechnology can increase the productivity and provide resilience to salinity, droughts, uh, plights, and diseases to increase the adaptation of species to the climate changes, creating new varieties and more efficient traces, using the microorganisms, plants, and animals as bioreactors for the production of some specific products. With this biotechnology, modern biotechnology, we can eliminate the undesired genes, so we can generate a new reform for the genetic advancement. We have an example, for example, of salmon, transgenic. Well, you see it is in the picture, you can see the difference in size. And you can see the uh, gene targeting for the elimination of genes. We can increase the productivity There are also animals that do not get sick with a crazy cow disease, for example, and the livestock is re replaced by embryo, by prions, so they cannot replicate the virus. Now, in another stage, in this biotechnology, modern biotechnology, there is work doing to replace the animals in the production of food. Well, there is, there is some synthesis of milk. Uh, the gray is the protein that comes in the milk. And this is done by a culture of tissues. This is going to cause a revolution in the way in the future. So the future already started. The thing is whether we are prepared for the future. So as an example, if we want to be prepared for the future and we want to embrace the new technology, there is a law of moratory in the development of genetic engineering in Peru. So at present, there is more than 190 million hectares with transgenic crops. And well, we are limiting our future because by law, we are banned to make this uh, research in technology. We have competitors in agriculture with the modern biotechnology. So we need to face the challenges of the future today. We don't have to wait for the future to come without doing anything. We have to join the group of the technological scientific group that is making the future not as a tail, but as a main actor. 
it, Peru was that in the pre-Columbian era, development of agriculture, irrigation, metallurgy, etc. And we can go back to be that again, a country like that, with a vision of the future and with innovation. We have genetical resources that are abundant, but we need the investment to build the human and physical capacities. And of most of all, we need to change the mindset and to move forward as human beings. The empire of reason and law over traditionalisms, fanatism, dogmatisms, and in group interests in order to be able to achieve a sustainable development in the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blanco, a very interesting presentation, the vision to the future in using modernity technology for the what is coming to us. We have the third and last presentation. Engineer Viera, please. Manuel Viera, you have the floor. Can you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Option for presentation, please. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, your invitation to be with you, with a lot of speakers and the panel members that are accompanying. The presentation I have prepared was done yesterday, I apologize if eventually there could be a typo. As you can see, at some point, all the primary sector, it was called like that 50 years ago, mining and agriculture were very relevant. More agriculture than mining. Agriculture has always been stronger. As a matter of fact, in Chile, part of the laws were made based on agriculture. So they always, both sectors always live together. Today, with excellent prices of metals, the GDP probably in mining probably will reach 15%. And at present, agriculture could reach five or a little bit more and both can contribute to 20% of the GDP. They generate labor, about 2 million people interested. The water is a resource that we really have to take care of because as the previous panel members mentioned, we are in the sixth place of the most vulnerable countries in the world. And we think having a drought in cities and towns that need to make a rational use of water. They don't have the water supply 24 hours and the rivers are almost dry. Climate change is a global challenge. Here you can see the three areas, the animals, where we are included, the mineral world, where we work, and the vegetable or vegetables uh, area where agriculture and the related activities live. We need to consider that mining the rocks before there was life, rocks were there before. And we see the moon, Mars, the rocks are there. If there would be water, the life could start. In that way, we have to be very clear and I hope the colleagues will agree and some NGOs that are against mining will understand that. Yeah. 
Wait, 50 years ago? Well, we feel a little romantic when we can identify these equipment on the screen, the Betamax, the computers that you see there. And for those who really studied with this um, drill uh, cards uh, in the computers, we really got a nightmare to arrange them under the these kits. I would like to tell you that I support what was mentioned by the colleague from the previous talk, is that precisely we are living with technology. So, so very quickly, I would like to say that Latin America it has mining wealth and obviously social conflicts arise. But we need to be very clear that first of all, in order to have raw materials, we need to know that Latin America has the highest wealth in minerals of the world. It is true that there are social conflicts related to projects and production activities, but we should display all the efforts to improve the dialogue. Water is the main factor of the protest. The appetite to extract gold in the Amazon the drug trafficking now is focused in gold. Use of mercury, which is the poison of the artisanal and illegal mining. The world, and especially the European community, punishes the environmental crime. They are demanding the green certificate, and that could generate better prices. We have the indigenous peoples vis-a-vis -vis the illegal mining. In general, we should consider that in the ranking, many times Chile and Peru are the more attractive countries. There are many factors. Chile went down 26 positions because of the different aspects of the tax reforms, one after the other, and that obviously has involved some complications. The communities now demand equality, but well, they are demanding to be part of, and therefore it is important to know that the best entrepreneurial equation is the support of mining to other sectors, especially agriculture, that is a key factor, because agriculture is related to feeding, to food. This is the planning in Chile of looking at the future up to 2030. Here you can see at the top the virtuous mining because obviously it has to be automated with high technological standards. Tourism and then we have agriculture, food, healthy food. And then we have the other activities, the creative economy, fishing and aquaculture, etc. But all of that is related to a platform that is the logistic. If you have a very good deposit at 800 kilometers, you don't have the logistic. It is likely that that project is going to suffer. So we need a public policy protection. Today, the mining credits are building roads solar and water energy. That's very interesting. We realize that we need to generate renewable energy. Smart industries and also manufacture based on artificial intelligence and the bio industry focus mostly on health. This is what Chile is planning up to 2030. Obviously, I'm not going to explain But clearly, I think that these are the different types of, uh, of practice. In, in Chile, we talk about the mining. Respect to the nature of living beings. So how can be opposite to this philosophy? The economic growth, basically, that was in 2019, 2020, and 21, a little bit more. 
maybe a 15 percent you see the exports of 53 percent and i think we're going to reach 70 percent this year there has been a significant growth in the region 28 percent of the global production of copper because of the price of copper we are talking about of a um, increase up to 10 percent and employment in a direct and indirect manner is around 10 percent the tax burden at present we are very complicated because at present it is 44.5 percent so if the congress approves this the changes that is going to reach almost 80 percent Well, this is a climate change. I insist to talk about agriculture and mining. And uh, successful entrepreneurial management. Well, as you can see, this is a large coast. And in the north, you can see part of the mining activities very little agriculture but with social responsibility all the mining companies provide support to the crops to agriculture in the communities how is the this is how it, it is working in the north in the south it is fully agricultural with livestock with forests so in the south the south of Chile, practically, is a virgin field for mining, but it is difficult to access because of communities and environmental issues. El agro anda bordeando cerca del 4 al 5 por ciento en estos momentos, digamos, que es la contribución al PIB. We see the contribution of agriculture to the GDP. You have agriculture, livestock, fruit production, which quite strong in we can also look at the regional level in workforce so we have direct job and the temporary workers as we call them whenever there's only harvesting season they will arrive so it's more than a million people that is uh, working at the agricultural sector let's have a look at the, the wages the industry that pays the most is mining you see Vilano's uh, values on different primary wages if you compare the different values with agriculture um, this is more or less 400 or 500 US dollars generally the industry has been reducing the global carbon emissions so if we look at the balance, we have 46 uh, CO2 balance values. And by 2025, we will probably get up to halving this value because of the different practices included to reduce this impact. On the importance of the mining sector, Chile, uh, spends 24.085 percent per capita but we are still having some serious issues because uh, the fall and of prices of ores uh, are uh, experiencing a decrease as you can see we're getting up to 0 0.76 in new projects in quarters you have 0 0.3 or 4 percent so this will definitely mean that um, there should be a, a, a change and it is a, an issue of competitiveness to address. These are the costs 
Therefore, you need to be more creative to have a stronger profile and try to keep on working on the mining in Copperfield. We believe that uh, the industry of Peru, uh, the mining industry of Peru, which is polymetallic, will probably do not suffer as much on the impact because of a reduction of the grades. The participation of Chile at uh, the worldwide level, you see a reduction due to the effect that I previously explained. Mining exports uh, have 55% last year, and previously this year we will get up to 60% by the end of the year. For each peso, for each dollar that arrives, Chile 9 uh, comes from the mining sector. And this is also something that you can look at when uh, you look at this chart, the planning and the forecast for 2030. The expected value will be 7 million tons and the most optimistic, optimistic a scenario 8.079 and 6 is the uh, less satisfactory scenario. You have the mining investment up to 2029, a country total level 74 million, and we hope that the, the political scenario will not have a negative impact on those values. A quick analysis on Latin America, the lack of public policies. There's huge resources of uh, resources around the world, but there's uh, bad management and exploitation and, and trading of those. And you are looking sometimes at uh, the uh, importance of the uh, added value provided uh, by the different uh, stakeholders, a lot of uh, community and environmental conflicts. Those uh, are reducing our competitiveness, of course. Pollution, sustainability are the main challenges. And electromobility also provides an opportunity for the region. It's an historic opportunity. Lit, Litten, all these different new mines that are located in Latin America. That could probably be a new gate to the future. So, Latinos, I ask you all. What are the challenges to the continent for Latin America? Are we enough and significant? Let's have a look at this. This is our continent. But let's have a look at this. If we join forces, Latin America is probably the largest, one of the largest continents. So we are probably greater as a concept, I mean, uh, rather than in, in a hectare state. We are large. We are huge. We have a strong biodiversity in probably one of the best of the world. Each country has a great level of attraction. Let's have a look at the different pictures. This is the diversity I was referring to. But it is beautiful to see, right? But if you look at the F statistics, what can we say if we see this as a group? We are one of the largest economies around the world. It's not me saying, but it is the FMI. And, and it's 2020 report. You have the US, EU, India, this place. So we actually need to believe that this is true. But why are we always working alone? And we're not joining forces in cooperation. We do have uh, some strength at different levels, but this is important to look at as a possibility. Let's look at Latin America and the Caribbean and the different ores and minerals that report by CEPAL. So we have 71%, 11% gold. Uh, and, and, and of course, we are producing in the, the uh, copper of the world. Only Chile and Peru together. So this is something that I want to bring your attention to. China grew because of Amer Latin America. Let's look at this chart on the left. The Export and input balance of natural resources and commodities is negative for Latin America. But what is happening in China? It is it is exactly the exports of uh, minerals that we're sending to China through this uh, whole commodity game that they are extracting a huge advantage. 
throughout that trade. So you can have a look at the loss of capacity of manufacturing power and we have not actually seen that we have probably increased the export of raw material. We have lost 20 or 30 percent of our own manufacturing capacity. You see the macroeconomic values which are important. Yes, we have created profits for the country, but at the end we are realizing that at the end it won't not look like a bright future. And um, what is the strong challenges in the region. Poverty on the one hand, we need to fight poverty. In summary, climate change and election mobility will probably provide us a huge historical possibility where we can work together. We have copper on the one hand, so electric mobility will require more copper. Cars will probably get or need 80 or 85 kilos of copper, nickel, cobalt, and lithium as well. And I will show you later what that means. That basically, this is a good example by Angie. And this is a very typical example. You have 17 trucks in line, 600 liters of diesel per day, which represent about 150 tons of CO2 per day. What will happen then? And I'll show you an example. This uh, 70,000 liters of diesel per day represent 21. 0.9 million of liters per year. A diesel liter will normally create 10 kilowatts of energy. So we'll need 290 uh, per hour per year. But efficiency will also represent 30% of the energy that will translate into the work of the diesel engine. So if you do the math, you have the cells of A2 that will be probably more efficient up to 50 or 60 percent. So what are we still, uh, doing then? If we look at lithium, if you see the triangle or even the square of lithium in this case, where you see Peru also in the map and you see Bolivia, 21 million tons are held in Bolivia, 17 million tons in Chile, 19 million tons in uh, Argentina and 3 million tons in Peru, which will probably be adding up in the future. So this is the main challenge, which are our enemies, poverty, the pandemic, the historical inequality, uh, robbery, the bad politicians, corruption, pollution, the lack of public policies and climate change. But which are the value proposals? Uh, we need to get up to an economic and social development, social justice, uh, legal and tax stability, the distribution of richness, the improvement and enhancing of investment and digital transformation, the automation and robotization, uh, the improving and keep on working with the planet mining or astro mining. When all different countries are uh, just trying to play around with astro mining, it's also, uh, you well, we need to at least be in, uh, doing some research on this sense. And this is exactly the animal of the obsolescence I was referring to before. This is a mustard that eats food, people, species, everything. And if we are getting a stack all in with the old technology, we shouldn't stay in here, not even at the country level, nor is a region. This technological metamorphosis, we call it metamorphosis because go whole transformation that will lead to uh, the use of uh, technological devices. Lots of autonomous digital stations will be at the city level, so there will be less exposure to transportation of stuff, for instance. And on the right side, you have the supervisor, the new supervisor, a drone that will be trained with AI so that they could simply be looking at what is happening, you're sharing this online and I will provide some specific orders uh, throughout that perspective. This is exactly what I was referring to. In summary, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean has huge mineral reserves in the uh, region. 
is a one a mining exporting industries of commodities and with its important role of exportation. We need to look at the supply cycle of the commodities uh, that improved and its exchange. Uh, Chile and Peru may probably have more flows because of the uh, effects of the pandemic, but not because of the quantity and not because of the manufacturing. The uh, region will lose their natural patrimony and there will be a risk of environmental sustainability because you're reducing the non-renewal resources. Challenges and opportunities of mining governance to contribute to sustainability is so important. Legal mining, how to solve illegal mining? Something else that we've been studying in Chile for to share with all of you, have to recover our soils uh, through the Yatrofa Curtas plantation, which requires less water. And of course, we have a, a long stripes of desert nearby Santiago. So if you have this specific plantation, we could be probably not only working with that, but it could also create oil, fuel that may be useful as energy source. Also, a, an important need for industrializing the mineral resources and agricultural support is also needed. And as a region, we are a strong power because of the commodities, intellectual capacity. We need to be creative and use our imagination. You need to uh, look at exactly what the future may look like as a big challenge, positive challenge, and this will create a magic engineering, what I was referring to before. Boy mining, magic mining, because we will have good, uh, dignified jobs, better uh, salaries, equity. We will have what we call happiness at work and also the generation of flows uh, income for countries and we will be safe and will have a decarbonized uh, system in place. These are the main challenges and the goals we want to get. Thank you and apologies if I take more than the time than expected but <laughs> I just had to go through quite quickly. Apologies for that but I hope that you were able to follow me and my presentation. Thank you. Thank you Manuel for such a great uh, and interesting presentation. So now we will move to the panel members who were listening to the presentation, especially in our current condition, and especially what it is, uh, pandemic is also creating as an additional external crisis element. I would like just in order to try to keep it short and, uh, and I will give five minutes to each of the panel members, uh, Engineer Bertley, please. A, we, you have your mic off, maybe you need to turn it on. Hello, hello. Yes. Perfecto. Better, now we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we were really able to listen to this three great presentations which share with us a clear a point of view. On the one hand, we had uh, the uh, overview of the problems and challenges of climate change and how we should actually rephrase it and how we can have this proactive role uh, to look at it. Then we had two other presentations that uh, follow the line of technology on the actual challenge, uh, not only for uh, 50 years from now, but actually today's challenge, which is that uh, the future just started now, right? Technology is just uh, advancing quite fast and uh, it is very important for uh, activities in for the Peruvian case and for the Chilean case, in this case, mining and agriculture, 
agribusinesses and agriculture, both, uh, which are the drivers of uh, the creation of uh, employment, have to face this specific challenge. I recall maybe 20 years ago, I was invited to uh, participate as a speaker in, and to visit some mines in Australia. And I stopped in New Zealand to have a look at their technological development. And I got to know a technical expert in New Zealand to know how to work with the blueberries in Chile. If, uh, sorry, sorry, in Ica. Oh. But, uh, of course, we do not have uh, the temperature appropriate for blueberry production. But just simply technology, genetics, uh, made it possible. Blueberries could be cultivated around Peru everywhere. This is the challenge then to be in the wave uh, of um, generation of know-how and knowledge. By looking at the future, for sure, it's a minor, I need to emphasize the fact of the large potential of Peru and Chile to increase our participation in production of minerals. We were looked at uh, countries uh, quite attractive for investment in global mining companies have looked at us and, and give us priority. But at this point today, both countries have public policies in place that could easily place both countries into non so friendly, mining friendly countries. And then we probably move somewhere else where they could develop their activities. And I think that this is a challenge that we need to reflect on. In, in the agro-industry, it is important to show that the whole Peruvian coastline is needing water, and Peru has water, but 93% of water moves to the Atlantic, and only 7% comes to the Pacific Ocean. And we are not managing properly, it just goes through the sea. So it is an issue related to engineering, on a promotion on investment on infrastructure for water management purposes we could be able to develop the whole coastline, at least those areas which are still deserted. For instance, between Ica and Pisco, we have such large amounts of land that could be easily transformed in a few years into, could also be a cultivation area. The potential is huge. So let's uh, forget about the conflicts in between the two regions or between the two uh, areas. Mining and agriculture have coexisted for so many years. So I believe it is quite useful and interesting and important to see the future of these two economic sectors. Peru, of course, is way beyond its own problems and, and somehow or another, we will probably go beyond those challenges and I think that freedom of the economy and the market has uh, led us to higher standards and this should be the pathway we should keep on following. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Augusto. Engineer Velasquez, please. Panel. I'm very pleased to uh, be part I agree. I think the 
implemented has led us to this point and related to the market that will be the driver that will probably move ahead in the next 50 years and I want to of course both my experience as a businessman and as a public sector servant I've seen an increase double uh, the growth in the past 20 years compared to the 80 percent growth worldwide uh, Augusto uh, has been also working in the sector at some point that he could say that it, it this grossly showing us that uh, we can still produce and the market will get what we produce so if we look at the export sector we see also different sides of exporters not only for fresh products but also added value production so the strength of this sector that it get us up to higher levels and numbers of export that will probably lead us to 8 million this year make us think is this to look at the small farming it's a sociable uh, probably for um, why do we need to help the organized farmer with the uh, technological uh, know-how so that they become partners, partners on this value change, create a strategic alliances. Why? Because because it is important. It is important to we had a meeting and when we. Uh, seen some changes on your policy so we need to specifically show as a sector an organized sector decide to work together with family agriculture and uh, when I was a public officer we share a proposal to create a public policies um, we uh, were thinking on celebrating Peru Verde Sierra Sierra Exportadoras program on the blueberries, for instance, that was mentioned by Augusto, and we uh, heard the support, we got the support of the different sectors that announced that they have already thousands of actors. It was a driver that created uh, the production in Trujillo, for instance, so that it started with this boom of the blueberry, which led us to 15,000 hectares in the first, uh, uh, being the first uh, country in the world, uh, and high levels of export production of blueberries. So basically, how do we create those links, and uh, sisters? The second, a greater for maybe an opportunity for the government to organize all these different stakeholders that uh, together with the private sector, we can work together based on the previous experience and so not starting from scratch. We already have national programs in place, like the program on cheese, for instance, where Dr. Vivanco also took place and they have won prizes in Brazil, international prizes. So this program started 10 years ago and Dr. Vivanco was a consultant at that time. So they are already the success stories to share and ask awareness to get to know those success stories, to incorporate those in their own programs on how to better produce quinoa, how to provide added value to it, how to increase the, the value change, how to join the producer with the exporter and create a stronger linkages and alliances. Manuel said that uh, in Chile, Mayan agriculture live together. Let's translate this experience to Peru. I think it is needed and urgent. Peru is waiting for that strong connection between the two different sectors. And on public policies and climate change, Chile is also showing us a good example and decision on decarbonizing. That's a public policy where the private sector accepted to join efforts and they're changing electrical um, cars or in, and changing diesel uh, engines to electrical engine of uh, crops to, to those future crops uh, that may be also needed to uh, be applied in Peru because there will be a change in temperature for sure and we will need to look for new crop 
Pastor. Thank you for this opportunity. And just to um, maybe ask some questions to our panel members on and their experiences. Augusto, uh, in your experience, uh, is the main player in the mining sector Which is a recommendation. How do you think if both uh, activities could uh, work towards sustainability and improvement of quality of life? So how do you want um, or what do you think can be done in order for these activities to come closer? I think in practice we've been already working together. I think that mining and agriculture have to coexist and, and co-develop. I remember the times of the Cerro de Pasco Corporation, where uh, you see the development of the Central Cordillera, the Central Highlands, was a very good example together with the support of the mining. Um, activities and the Cerro de Pasco company uh, support and, and strong role in the development of the Mantaro region. So now we're moving to more sophisticated examples by supporting agriculture, agro-business, some mining companies um, in their programs and plans uh, highlight uh, agriculture and livestock activities in their own programs. They provide technical assistance or support to the agribusiness and join them together with the projects they implemented in the communities uh, through their engagement uh, programs. This is something that we are already seeing, and there's still a lot of room uh, for improvement and changes. Thank you for sharing these uh, examples uh, based on the experience, basically, with the different sectors. Uh, Alfonso, um, maybe another question to you specifically related on your experience on the experience of juntos program i think that um, that was such a great uh, example together with sierra exportadora these two programs that were quite important how could you replicate or how can we replicate this specific model in order to create more sustainable development and territorial inclusion so that um, whenever you see the strengthening of different economic activities in one specific area, how can we use these specific examples of programs that, um, so that we can replicate them and, and by looking at the development of these two different activities? Thank you, Augusto. Yes, I was a, a president, executive director of Juntos. So we were providing 100 soles in Ayacucho, Huancabelica, Huanuco family, poor families received uh, 100 soles. Um, and that created uh, this multiplier effect that contributed to the reduction of poverty up to 20% at that time. I remember that by 2005, we had 50% uh, of poverty. And after one year of uh, starting uh, that uh, social benefit support with 100 soles, we also support the access to health uh, on uh, education. You remember that at that time, lots of people do not have ID, and we have them. Have them. And we were recall, for instance, groups of women that were collecting money, and they were saving money in order to create their own um, 
small businesses and, and I remember one woman who was uh, selling uh, guinea pigs but he, he came and asked for support, uh, for more help. I understood at that time that civil societies should also be part of this whole process of, of rural development since we were unable at that time, because there was no organized civic society, we went to the mayor, the mayors uh, that uh, were working at that level and they were trying to support uh, the citizenship. And so we uh, look at the uh, pattern of public policies uh, that was stressing in this specific world for this idea of training mayors to show uh, their achievements so that they could get a specific award. That was a great public policy that got lost some time. There's a, a warning for mayors, you know, promotions of different mayors and move to the district level, uh, up to congressmen <laughs> up to this point, without any corruption. Uh, his involvement, which was great. So this idea of looking at the rural areas and the potentials of the rural areas through well-organized uh, programs, if mayors support the support of the um, politicians at that level and with the support and, and campaigning of the citizenship, the civil society, that uh, could probably strengthen the work that we can great thank you thank you uh, thank you Alfonso for sharing this uh, different examples I think it is also important especially because of both your experience in the public and private sector I think that probably one of the challenges that we have seen throughout this whole section climate change electromobility and clean um, energies. Con, 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 con una industria también, como industria Food que security, está... agribusiness, creating benefits for formal employment, responsible employment that also create profits. Likewise, the mining sector that also creates this macro stability and to avoid inflation and exchange rate fluctuations that may create more problems to all sectors, to all businesses. These two sectors will definitely be able to contribute and enhance the other activities because there are other activities that are also as important in the country, but for sure because of the potential as we were able to see in the presentation, what a uh, agriculture can do and create and generate is such an important player and as well as uh, the food production of course uh, it is always uh, the important to look at how safe uh, food should be especially now under the pandemic in fact we should probably need to have that and that should be so important for us to focus on and safe in healthy food and, and to enhance also uh, those uh, sources to avoid any impact like the one that we've been experiencing in the past two years with the pandemic. I think trends are favorable. If we look at these uh, as opportunities, as new ways of uh, growing, uh, what will come with copper, zinc, and the new ores or minerals that could be used throughout this whole energetic transition era, what we've been hearing in the COP26 recently. We may be able to contribute in that line with a mining sector that is leading worldwide, and it's something that we should also recognize uh, the agriculture sector is, is strong with the, also an important place in at the world level. Water and environment have also been discussed as two main issues that we will probably be discussing uh, in the next days in Agromin. But thank you. I think we exceeded the time, <laughs> the, the time that we were allocated. Final words? Uh, yes, if you allow me to. I think that all these uh, 
comments, share, be uh, any speakers in, uh, in our internal discussion. I think that uh, have a specific round uh, to become reality, and I think Engineer Vivanco highlighted this, and I think it's important to repeat it. It is important reasoning to be in first place, and also law. If, if both do not work, apply, or exist, we are self-denying ourselves as a country to move forward in such a promissory scenario in, in, with such a rich country like Peru. Yeah, yes. for sure. And something else I would like to add to um, I didn't discuss much about the mining sector, but I was working when I was a public servant in uh, Blueberries in Huaraz and other programs of rural development. And the mining sector has uh, always supported a specific program for the project. The challenge probably is to involve communities into what the market, the whole market once, not only the local market. Remember, I was asking for the potential of the enhancement of the potential at the regional level. So, so basically, the idea of creating these clusters at the regional level, but also the creation of uh, projects uh, that the mining companies could probably enhance or support, but go beyond the domestic scope by looking at the comprehensive intention on how this will be probably be supported through export, export pathways that uh, will probably lead up to a better a, and stronger impact. And you're probably now emphasizing uh, some of the topics that we will be covering in the conference. The, the need and the reasonability and the state of law. For sure, what a lot, Alfonso just mentioned, we have also good examples of companies that it will show uh, how to go beyond the domestic markets and have a Yabeco or Cerro Verde examples that are uh, will be showcast uh, in the next topics and sessions along these three days. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. And we will move on to uh, our next panel session. Thank you, everyone, Dr. Kauzi, and I invite you. Thank you. To keep your cameras on for the picture. De este primer que han sido el bloque minería. The block mining six years from now. I would like to tell you that every day we're going to have a different topic. The topic today is opportunities in the face of big changes. The first one was mining agriculture fifty years from now. To invite Dr. Couch and the speakers to keep your cameras on so we can take a picture. Para recordar eh, este primer panel que de algún modo es el puntapié inicial para estas tres jornadas sumamente interesantes. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you especially and we invite you to continue participating in this important event. Thank you very much. We also would like to tell you, if you are just practicing, that we have simultaneous interpretation, both in English and Quechua. So when you enter the virtual platform of Agramin, you have options. There are some buttons, the upper part of this. Enter. You select English or Yaikui is Quechua. So if you select that button, you will listen the interpretation to Quechua. If you push enter, the translation will be in Spanish. And if you push in France, it will be the Spanish language that you will hear during the conference. That is the way to look for your language. We would like to thank the junior collaborators that are joining us in the second edition, like Dolphy, La Silva, MG Las Rambas, and American Silver Perisac, Jesenita Sea, Minera Boró, 
and also we would like to thank especially our media partner, the mining magazine Agro Perú, Milanina, Agro Exportaciones, and Minas, Exportar, Global Business Report, Agro Noticias, Proactivo, the magazine to Gourmet, Ecomun, Todo Minería, Minería y Energía, Norte Minero y Actualidad Minero. We want to thank them for being our media partners and for the support that they have given us in the dissemination of this event. And of course, the support that they have still given to us. Now, let's move to the second block. The topic will be climate change. The block that we last we will have speakers and panel members, but also I would like to tell you that one of the presentations will be in English, so you can select the language of your preference in Spanish or Texas. We have with us as the moderator for this blog, engineer Carlos Lorez de Mola, his founding president at Parque de la Vida, geologist engineer, director of the University, and he studied a positive degree mining engineering and mining economy with a master of science in the University of Minnesota. He also has a master in conservation and sustainable development by the University. Throughout the experience in mining environment and also the relationship with indigenous communities, mining authorities, and he has an interest to contribute for conciliation among the stakeholders. Social responsibility is very important. I'm very glad to welcome engineer Carlos Lorez de Mola, who will be the leader of this new next block. Good morning, engineer. Ingeniero, te invitamos a colocar, a desmutear su micrófono. And your microphone is okay. Well, I, I uh, thank you for the introduction, but <laughs> I work trying to fix problems. I think it's been a long time that the specialization has taken us to some extremes where we do not talk even with our neighbors. So the idea is to stop working in silos and do not work uh, separately and to see how we all together can push the Peru, the continent, in front of the situation that we are facing. Agromin started with agriculture and mining. I would like to change mining by extractivism and agriculture, other activities, and how we complement each other. One, to face the climate change, that it is a non-linear situation that is going to hit us very much. If the pandemics, well, we are trying to overcome what is coming with climate change, it's very difficult and we all have to be united and in peru i think even more having said so uh, we have Oli also uh, he's ready for his presentation the second presentation will be made by maria fernandez valley two specific topics one regarding the green steel to see how that situation can be shared with the rest of sectors and activities and the topic of Timber and Engineering that will be presented by Maria Fernando Valle. And finally, and the International Regional Preservation of Nature. And we, had, uh, we have lost uh, 22 minutes. So let's give. But we will continue with the panel. Oli, you have the floor now. Microphone, Oli. There you go. No. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's very good to be with you today. Um, I'm coming you with you to you live from from Sweden um, in the in the eight, late evenings, and it's quite already pitch dark outside, even though it's uh, it's just five o'clock. So, um, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll give a little uh, uh, talk about uh, steel um, and uh, some some interesting developments there in terms of climate change mitigation. 
Uh, let's just see if I can uh, manage to share my. Um, There we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk on the topic of climate change, more particularly, as I said, around steel and, and even more particularly around uh, hydrogen steel uh, value chains. A little bit about myself. Um, I am a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, SCI. SCI is a um, uh, non-profit uh, research institute focused on sustainable development. Um, we are based in, we have our headquarters in Stockholm, but we have 10 offices around the world, including one in, in uh, Colombia, Africa, and in, uh, in Asia, in Bangkok, in, and in Kenya, and a couple of those in the US. Um, I will speak, we have, you know, we are not steel industry experts as such, but we have been doing a lot of work on industry, heavy industry especially, because it's a key um, sector for, for decarbonization and getting to uh, zero emissions, which is becoming, uh, increasingly a focal point in, in a lot of climate change discussions. So I'll give you some insights and some uh, interesting discussion currently happening in, in steel and especially, specifically around hydrogen. So I'll, I'll call this hydrogen steel value chains. Where are we and where do we go? Um, so steel production currently makes up something like 8% uh, of global CO2 emissions. Um, obviously a really hot, uh, large share um, and if you look at what the, the International Energy Agency says about um, how we can get to net zero by 2050, which is increasingly a, a focal point for, for global, global plant policy, uh, global steel industry emissions has to be 90% to be lower uh, than, than uh, today, basically, which is obviously a really large challenge, given that um, uh, there's a lot of investments in steel production and a lot of uh, technology that's been around for a very long time. So if you look at what the IEA says about how we're going to achieve this reduction, well, first of all, I think a really important point would be to increase this, the share of scrap. So uh, you can basically produce steel either from, from iron ore, um, uh, going through the blast furnace and the basic oxygen furnace, or you can produce it by recycling uh, scrap in, in electric arc furnace, where you basically remelt steel and, and make new products of it. So uh, one key uh, thing that the, that the IEA says needs to happen to get to, to zero emissions is to increase the, the recycled steel, the scrap steel to almost 50% of the total steel uh, raw materials. Um, if you look at what the sort of product mix in terms of, or the sort of production system mix will be in 2050 according to the IEA, what they think uh, could be a valuable path forward, they think about half, um, of that uh, iron ore based steel production would come from uh, you know base similar process as we have today but added uh, carbon capture and storage or utilization 29% uh, they see coming from hydrogen direct production which is what I'm going to speak about mostly today about 30% also from from iron ore electrolysis which is a really up and coming technology basically you would, that you would produce uh, uh, iron and and then steel using the same kinds of technologies that you have today when you produce aluminum for example um, and then 5% only would be what sort of the, the remaining share would be what would be produced the same way we produce steel today mostly. So it's a really a large technical change that would need to happen to get to this point. So an interesting question, so this is what the IEA thinks, they make like these grand scenarios and move forward. Uh, and what we've been doing uh, within SEI and within a uh, um, uh, initiative that we're hosting called the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, which is a governmental initiative launched by India and, and uh, Sweden, uh, and now host uh, many governments, including also the US and, and a, very, a couple of European countries and Ethiopia. Uh, so we've been trying to track, so what are actually companies saying, uh, steel companies, what are they doing? Uh, not just looking at what the IEA says, but what are they doing in terms of investments and what are their plans? Um, and we've done this in a tool that we've called um, um, the Green Steel Tracker. Uh, basically on a website that you, that you can go into and sort of map what, what are sort of the announcements that steel companies are making in terms of their the strategies moving forward in terms of decarbonization and taking uh, reducing emissions. Um, and this database is updated quarterly and you can just go in and, and fill it in. And if you're working in the, in the sector, you can go in and, and see if we've misunderstood anything or, or if you want to put something in there, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to, to correct it. Um, but 
in, in addition to sort of just compiling these data about what's, what the companies are saying about their, their, their decarbonization efforts, we've also started to sort of do a little bit of a tentative analysis about the announcement that we, that we have in the database. Um, and, and it should be, it's important to say that these announcements that we compile in this database, they, they vary from sort of statements of ambition, basically what companies say, well, we're going to go for um, 2045, we're going to have so and so many uh, tons produced to be hydrogen. Uh, to sort of fully fledged um, investment decisions. Um, just to say that in, in Sweden now, in the north of Sweden, we have currently two uh, major projects going to aiming to produce uh, steel using the hydrogen route in five years. And uh, sites have been close, chosen and the permitting processes are ongoing. So it's, it's very close to you know, final investment decisions. Um, even though the permitting processes shouldn't be underestimated, as I'm sure it were. Um, anyway, so what we can see is that uh, the five largest steel producers in the world all have uh, stated ambitions wanting to go to uh, making really large emission reductions. Uh, but currently, a lot of the focus is in Europe. Of the products in this database of, of decarbonization uh, initiatives within the steel industry are, are based in Europe. Um, and 83% of the projects are, are in countries that have said that they're going to get go to net zero by, by mid-century, uh, which is now plenty of countries um, and um, have, has increased further with the, with the, uh, after the, the COP26 conference that was uh, in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago. So there, there seems to be a lot of activity going on. And if you look at the, the technologies that the, the companies are, are going for, it's interesting that um, most announcements are actually focused on hydrogen and especially on hydrogen direct reduction. Uh, which is an alternative technology, and I'll, I'll give a little bit more of a, an introduction on how that means in a, in a bit. Uh, whereas only a handful of projects are focused on CCUS, that is catching carbon from, from your processes. Um, and then a, a few each are, are focused on biomass or, or this uh, a bit of a more of a, um, an early technology, I would say. But what we can say from all this uh, database is that if you want to get to net, we're going to have some substantial technological shifts. And this sort of is an important thing to think about. So it's not just, we're not just gonna uh, have the same old steel production, steel industry in 2050 using a different technology. But if we in actually do these kinds of technological changes, it's gonna also affect the whole, how the whole value chain works. And I'm gonna do a little bit of an, um, expand a little bit on that point now. So if you just look at how, how how the role of technology in, in climate change and climate change strategies have been changing, say, there's been like a, a change from like tweaking to transition. So you I work within the system, the existing system, the fossil based system, or you sort of throw it out or replace it with something else. So 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot of focus on system preserving solutions where you basically had the same kinds of technologies, but to do ch something with it that sort of reduces emissions. So you, you instead of driving on uh, your car on gasoline use, use ethanol, or or um, you have the same coal power station, but you add a carbon capture solution, uh, and this would require a lot of carbon uh, pricing, which has been really difficult to to do. Uh, whereas now the focus is more and more on systemic change, and this is um, in the beginning typically more economically challenging, but these a lot of these solutions have been really successful in terms of getting costs down and getting deployment up. So we see this a lot with really rapid development in solar, which has gone down to like 90% in the last 10 years. Wind power has seen similar developments. Electric road transport is really accelerating. But the key thing to realize then is when you shift to these kinds of technologies, you're also think, you know, changing a lot of the sort of techno-economic logic. How does the system work? And that means how the whole how, that the whole value chain uh, is bound to change as well. So for example, with, with coal power, for example, you have to produce that centrally and then you pull the wires to the house for example, whereas uh, solar PV you can put on your rooftop and no one would put a coal power station in their backyard or typically most people won't. So there's a very di clear difference there, difference there to understand. And I, I think this, this is the kind of thinking that needs to be taken into um, steel as well when we see this transition. Um, so I just make that point a little bit further. Uh, these, this, this left part here is typically how the value chain for, for steel production looks now. You start with iron ore. You have coal that you feed into a coke plant, and the coke is then reduced uh, used in the um, uh, blast furnace together with the iron ore. You take the oxygen, you use the coke to take away the oxygen from the iron ore. 
So you get pure iron, which is then fed into the blast oxygen, uh, the basic oxygen furnace, where you reduce the carbon amount further in the steel or within the iron to the point where it gets the steel, which is um, the difference between iron and steel is, of course, that the, uh, is the carbon content. And then you can move into the sort of downstream processing, casting and rolling and turning into uh, cutlery or, or vehicles or, or whatever. Uh, the, if you look at the hydrogen-based value chain asset, you can, you can take several paths, but this is the one that's being developed most commonly uh, in a lot of projects, including the ones in Sweden that I talked about before, where you feed electricity into an electrolyzer, which is basically a machine that takes electricity and water and electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and then they feed hydrogen to a, a direct production shaft where the, you use the hydrogen instead to remove the oxygen from the iron ore. Uh, with, so instead of, uh, when you do this using coke in the dust furnace, your byproduct is carbon dioxide, which is what we want to avoid. And in the direct production shaft the, using hydrogen, the byproduct is instead water. H2O. That is, of course, a lot better from a, a climate change mitigation perspective. And then when you have the pure iron, you can put that in an electric car furnace, uh, basically melt the, the iron and combine it with scrap. Uh, and then you have the, basically the same kind of product. So it's, it's a, you have similar steps along the way, um, reducing the iron ore into iron and uh, producing steel and so on. But these kinds of the equipment that you have here is completely different to what you have over here. So it's, you need to start thinking about something that how this changes the whole structure of the steel value chain. Uh, because it's important to see here that there is different ways of cutting the cake here. If you look at uh, the traditional steel value chain, this one on the side here, these, the, all these are almost always in the same place. Very you have all these uh, components, the coke plant, the last furnace, and basic oxygen furnace, and the downstream processing in the same one location. And you can do that also with uh, the hydrogen-based uh, route, but you, it's not a must. It, there are options, and I think this is a really important thing to think about, because depending on the context, you can configure it otherwise. Uh, and I give some examples here from, a, I think, an interesting study that came out last year uh, uh, from some uh, re Australian researchers who did uh, look at how can Australia be part of these hydrogen-based steel value chains. Uh, because Australia is a really interesting example in that it has a lot of uh, it's the world's largest iron ore exporter, but it also has some of the best uh, resources in the world when it comes to solar and wind electricity, which means they have uh, very good preconditions for, for uh, hydrogen and, and using that in, in iron ore reduction. So you can have, if you want to do the hydrogen route, you can put everything in one place. You can have a fully integrated steel mill. Uh, and this is one what one of the companies in developing this in Sweden is going to do. Uh, they're called H2 Green Steel, and they're very much focusing on having this as a fully integrated steel plant. Iron ore comes in at the very end, uh, and very uh, refined steel comes out at, at the end, at the, at the other end of the, of the steel mill. This is one option, and this is typically this very much mimics how, how steel is produced in the in the current system using uh, coal and the blast furnace. But you can also produce the hydrogen separately, so that you could have you produce the hydrogen at one location where you have the cheap electricity. And then you might ship the hydrogen to where you want to do your actual direct reduction. Um, and for in the Australian example that they've been thinking about there, this would be, for example, that you have your hydrogen produced in Australia, where you have your cheap electricity, and then you export the hydrogen via ship for, to, for example, Korea or to Japan, where you don't have the same kinds of renewable resources, but you might want to do the, the iron ore uh, reduction there and steel production. So you have maybe good steel production expertise there. This is one, another option. A third option is that you would do the electrolysis, you produce the hydrogen, and you do your reduction of the iron ore. You turn the, take the iron ore and the hydrogen and produce iron. And then you ship the, ore, the iron, pure iron, in a form called hot briquetted iron, HBI, and you, produce, you can then ship that to the end, or to the steel mill, basically, which in this case, the example that I use would be, for example, Japan or Korea. Then. So, and then you would have the sort of steel production, the downstream, the casting, the roll, and the refining, and the, and the alloying, or whatever, at that site. So, this is very important to think about, because depending on what actual geographical context is, you can set up these hydrogen-based steel value chains in different ways. And just to give that stress that point even further, 
another of the steel, the, the second steel initiative in Sweden doing the so, uh, government owned Swedish mining company who's going to basically do this, they're going to stop just uh, exporting iron ore, instead they're going to do the reduction of the iron ore into iron, so they're going to ship pure iron into global markets um, and do this on a completely massive scale. Uh, so it's interesting to see that just within Sweden, they have, they're very locate, closely located to each other, these two initiatives, but they're going for two uh, drastically, similar, uh, drastically different uh, approaches to the, this thing at the value chain. So I think this is super important to think about when you, when you want to understand how this can develop further. So basically, just to summarize, when you have this kind of technological change, um, you, you, you can think, of course, well, it's going to zero emissions. But what's more important, I think, to see, well, climate change mitigation policy and so on drives this transition. But what the actual effects, how they come out, you need to look beyond the climate, the greenness of it, and look at what the, the techno-economic logic and how the technological uh, logic changes and how that affects how you how you how your whole value chain, how your whole business model is set up. Um, so it's not just how you know how basically this how things are produced will change both the where and the who. So it's not necessarily the same old actors, the same old steel producers is gonna be the 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 dominant one in this hydrogen based steel value chains. Because it's another key point taken from the Swedish example is that one of these steel companies it's a complete startup. They've they've never they didn't exist two years ago. So it's a it's a startup company moving to invest three billion euros or three billion dollars into a unheard of. There hasn't been a steel mill uh, built from the ground up in in Europe in 50 years probably, but this is not happening. And it's a completely new thing that's uh, that needs to be paid attention to and how this can change how how these industries change as as technology change. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to close, and, and I'll be glad to um, either answer questions now, or if you can send them to me via email, and I'll, I'll advise you to, to check out the, the website that we've done, and we're tracking this project, project to see see all the uh, very exciting things that are happening in this in this sector. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ole. Uh, please, uh, Maria Fernanda, if you can. Uh, I think we have a, a video from you. Carmen Salas, si ponen el siguiente, la siguiente presentación. Hola. Sí, Carmen Salas, a ver si por favor ponen la siguiente. Maybe we can share the video. Maybe we do need the technical support. Uh, we are we are actually only listening to the audio. I will start talking on the forest. How forests grow in the U.S. The southeastern part of the U.S. is the agricultural area. We can have a look at this at the map. And basically, forests are grown on the north of the U.S. And also, in the southern part of the U.S., the reason why, specifically in those areas, is due to the conditions for proper growth. We have... Uh, In the main central land area for a different crop, I will now talk on the 
making a pro in the US we have two to two point five millions of acres of trees. We represent one point six million of trees. Some forests are naturally regenerated but others need to be replanted. The third is source of renewable energy electricity and other bio energy sources. Let's harvest more than ten percent of the potential commercial trees and this definitely impact climate change because having more trees help to mitigate climate change to make it slower global warming is causing climate change the increase of temperature and the planet has caused the carbon emissions To the different human activities have strong impact and have increased the number of changes and speed of changes. So we have always experienced climate change along the history of the Earth, but due to the CO emissions, those changes are experienced in such a speed that animals have been extended the human animal in vegetable could get up to a level of extinction. There's several none due to the fossil fuel consumption for electricity for several industries, construction, the increase of the population, the deterioration of marine environments in the past years have also increased the span of fossil fuel use, causing this extreme heat, and therefore huge changes on climate. It is important to know that by just simply cutting and replanting a tree, it's so important to mitigate the changes. We have seen how dangerous it is for flora and fauna and humankind alike. The reduction of number of glaciers will also affect the increasing level of the seas and oceans, uh, creating threats in coastal cities or island countries. You also experience big forest fires, destruction of different environments that could be avoided if mitigation measures were in place. Try to mitigate in lo que es eh, pues la La, la, la producción de, de, de frutas y in the production of fruits we've seen lots of different industries when trying to implement these changes the idea is to also change uses of plastic for instance with measures that some countries have taken in order to control this place. we have seen also 
how we look at uh, this change. Lots of different businesses are related to timber production. The uses of timber products uh, has increased along the year. It is an important industry. This is a, a different ways of helping the environment, trying to look for support projects uh, related to reforestation, uses products that uh, will reuse uh, timber at different levels and other sources uh, for storing carbon is the reuse of steel and cemented constructions. They're not only using timber, we need to maybe look for different types of measures. Sometimes we are asked, what happens if we are cutting so many trees? Are we going to have more trees? Are we going to be destroying forests by cutting off trees? And I understand that concern. Yes. In the U.S., every time you cut a tree, they will replant. For one tree, you need to plant 10 trees. Nine point five or nine point eight percent increase in Latin America. We would really like to see that same rate in deforestation. But if we look at all the different impacts on climate change, we definitely could uh, see that the, there is a actions taken and you will definitely see the difference in between numbers. We have forests that have been used. On the one hand, we can say that's good, but it also contributes to the risk of forest fires. And this may be an impact in its consumption and sale. The old trees, not necessarily as much oxygen. Okay, so maybe the planting of new trees and using of old trees could be useful for the whole system and that will definitely fit the environment. We are representing two associations, Southern Forest Products Association, which is a non-profit. It is not selling any timber, but it certifi provides certificates uh, for specific producers of trees in the U.S. You have a specific type for pine forest trees. You have the strength of timber. It is right at 19% with this uh, humidity content, it has a stronger ability in treatment skill. Density is also quite high and it is uh, one of the most resistant varieties. The quality of fiber definitely provides better solutions and the quality of constructions to be more efficient. And of course, uh, timber in the US specifically for pine trees have to go through an inspection and it is qualified based on the abilities on the uh, resistance or whether it will be used for structural facilities or only uh, for the creation basically this pine tree type oh, it's more resistant and it also is more resistant compared to other varieties it's used mainly for construction or for packing and this is specific certificate it's a quality certificate and 
specific qualifications requirements through that specific certificate the type or degree of timber where it was uh, cut the number or specific unique code allocated to it the production it goes through humidity level so this is the certificate that exactly lets you know what you're buying, what are you mainly using. Usages basically for construction, for a specific support, roof or wall supports that uh, are to be made to handle strength heavy materials. It has a good appearance. It is also quite useful for the treatment that goes through. This uh, timber may come uh, and prepare via different treatment procedures. It is dry, open dry, so uh, it could uh, also re be um, And having the strength enough for its uh, health and appearance and sustainability. The characteristics of this timber, it's again passed, it provides a good color, it could be also paint. It, it has the same values of uh, strength compared to non-treated wood. And it also has lots of different characteristics. And this is the seal, basically, that uh, shows the treatment, the type or species, it is such as the ID or the warranty certificate if they treat the timber depending on the treatment, it change color and again, it, it's used uh, inside, outside water for construction purposes. So how many stories, external, external cabinets, that will be in touch with the uh, different potential pests uh, or terrains. And in this case, a yellow pine could be also used in the mining sector because of its uh, capabilities, it could uh, support lots of loads. And this is probably one of the main advantages of this type of wood. In APA, the Wood Association, it's again an um, to the, the timber products and applications, and it provides uh, services to the final consumer. It also carries out uh, quality assurance uh, standards, uh, tests uh, that uh, will definitely complement the certificates. APA has different services. I should not go through all the lists of services provided by the APA, but this is just a, a way to show them to you. But why is it important to use uh, this uh, type of woods? Basically, the uh, load uh, capability, the weight and resistance, the using type of timber in earthquake prone areas like in Peru, their mother of fiber is stable. So lots of different advantages uh, if focus on these specific boards. But what are these specific engineering boards? And I just want to go through this quite quickly. We will look at exactly what it is used for a beam, the beam construction that is in use. And the most common uses are for floors, for um, steel um, reinforced concrete constructions. And this is used mainly for reinforced works on the furniture for packing. This is a specific a type uh, for a forework. Forework uh, that could depend on the different uh, usages and sizes, and it was used for a specific, uh, we call the in, in 
fall concrete and depending on the capacity of the extractor and the beam use it is also working for coding in, in casings and of course it is done and applied in all the different building construction you will get up to the different uses of this type of boards I will talk about the oriented strand boards these are basically uh, specific boards for several uses basically again for coating for furniture and for construction because again of its resistance to heavy load there you see an example of OSB on structures such as houses and you also uh, specifically uh, focus on the use for mining um, facilities they're easily installed in camp site for instance you will have the different advantages of applying these OSB in so many countries that have been used in the Europe and in Chile specifically in South America they use this type of boards for a mining sites so they are easily to transport with fair build easy to build it, it, it has a good sermon isolation system it is allowing energetic savings it, it can last for years if you use appropriate fittings it's an structural board so heavy load is accepted it's and money you can easily repair Another important product is the specific beams, timber beams. This is normally an MSR timber with specific quality requirements and the body is basically using the OSB timber. It is used for floors but also for ceilings. And, and the other product is the LBAL normally you have the uses of fish again for beams for uh, cementation floors it is quite used uh, for the um, windows uh, specifically and also for the specific uh, parking areas you also see the use of LBL um, because of the size structural use of this normally for the uh, beams as you can see uh, the main headers and normally uh, people will think that uh, timber uh, built constructions may not necessarily be as strong as metal or steel but you can see an example what happened what happened with the beams against fire in this case you see the how resistant it is and it, it protects the internal timber so the volume will be stable enough and you see it still simply break and smell and the final uh, type of uh, timber uh, it's a cross laminated timber where you have a unique extractor very similar to the LBL it is also used for headers for beams columns ceilings floors and walls it's easy to, ins easy to install and you won't need any further treatment and this is structural boards again have the seal how to sign the seal you have again the classification of the type durability the standard it is this seal that tells you exactly its characteristics and how to use it where to use it this is an important certificate and here I'm showing a good guide or handbook in the construction guide 
This is an example. This is a flood construction that was built in a specific area in a royal, and you have this 20, 244 units, and you could only take a few areas or spaces. You use a specific board, the PCL, the LBL, the plywood, the PCL, the OSB, and the iJoyce. And by using these different boards, timber boards, it takes one or two months for construction phase. And you see that you're using um, 4.495 tons. Uh, so we were reducing or avoiding the uh, 9,554 uh, CO2 emissions, which created a total benefit of 14 or 49 tons. This is a comparative chart showing timber versus concrete and acero. I made a comparison on different constructions made of these three different materials. And that will represent a, a big different change. If you look at the values, you see the increase of emissions and the savings it represented 22% to 71 percent which is a great competitive fact. how to avoid climate change will basically reduce the emissions using renewable energies goes through a transition with low carbon emission use renewable materials and reforest architects play an important role for all this process because they need to design and increase productivity since the very beginning of works, they need to design and use wood that will store CO2, um, avoid the usage of steel or cement and for construction. This will also be reflected into economic savings. Well, architect, the engineer, the final user, they need to specify the usage of these uh, timber for um, energy savings. Some other advantages, uh, quality under construction, the usage of these boards uh, make uh, create a reduction in the construction time. And of course, the reflection on the savings on money, which make you safe. Uh, a bit compared to other materials. At this point, we are seeing the creation of new techniques, new, new uses and production steps for more sustainability and efficiency. And the concern of the university environment is uh, making a new, this, uh, new alternative viable compared to the other products. So we need to actually look for it. One of the main advantages and there is a in it does create a very very important advantage. I don't know whether do you have any question if you have any questions, please, you can contact me. Thank you. Uh, Maria Fernanda. Uh, uh, thank you, Maria Fernanda. As I said before, we have seen different opinions. Uh, we have to see how they move forward. The neutral carbons from the floor. He is in IUCN, he is going to give us the opinion. The topic of all of us is how do we put together the two extremes to make of our country, of our region and the global a uh, place easy to live at. Gabriel, uh, you have the floor. I'm going to share my presentation. Thank you, Carlos. 
I would like to thank Agromin for the possibility to accompany you in this exchange of opinions. Greetings from Quito, where I live now, as Carlos mentioned. The presentation that I'm going to make goes a little backwards with regard to what has been presented only and our colleague who spoke before me regarding the specific opportunities to act in front of climate change. I take some steps backwards in the logic of what do we need to change in terms of the paradigm, the way that we understand how we reach a production, starting from the assumption that the mining sector has a huge potential to support the growth of activities in other sectors, like the agricultural sector and other extractive areas. We think that it is necessary to change the view as to how we understand this production in a sustainable logic towards the future. Respond to some of the challenges that have been put forward to us related to the loss of species and biological Now, if you allow me, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, yes, looks well. Let's see. What we could say that we see here, we see the contrast between the ecosystem, a natural ecosystem and the area that is prepared to receive a productive activity in agriculture in a tropical area. What I see is this. Basically, the traditional model that we have used globally, that is to receive a subsidy or a credit to be linked to a productivity of the soil, to the capacity to generate production products that for what we have seen during the pandemics, climate change has arrived like uh, to a limit like it is happening to the credit cards. Mm -hmm. What has been the strategy globally to face the topic when you run out of credit? <laughs> what we did was to expand the line, to increase the line. As we see in the horizon, there is still a lot of space. So we tell the nature, nature give me more space. So in real life, when our credit reaches the limit, should be aware of the credit that I already used to consider the expansion of the credit. realizing that this subsidy that we have been receiving from nature is over. And now we, as global society, have to start returning part of that subsidy in order to maintain this credit open. Working with the logic of subsidy that is never ending, well, basically, it was already mentioned, previous speaker, the loss and the impact on the ecosystems and the species. This was taken from, from a publication one year before the pandemic started. It was an intergovernmental panel for biodiversity in the United Nations. It is equivalent to the famous ICT of climate change. And what they showed was basically 
the possibility of losing one million species if we do not change based on the use of the resources. We can see it here in another example. In this case, almost 200 species in a vulnerable situation in different parts of the world competing with the advancement of the industry like the palm oil production. Because it has been accepted, they grow where these species are located, so they put a lot of pressure on the possibility of, for future license of, of these species. Climate change, for example, for chimpanzee, we see these images in internet. There are tractors that are destroying the jungle to make some room for the production of palm oil. And to these pressures, specific pressures that are taking place in the world, we have to look at other types of pressures that are more structural, like climate change, also generated by men. But we envision something so big that most of the solutions go through how we respond to the impact that will be generated. And they are something that we see very clearly in Peru. For example, the retreat of the Andean glaciers. Here you have a graph until 2007. We can see how the glaciers have been lost and therefore the water availability. In these uh, snow peaks in Peru and Ecuador. And if we bring this information to 2021, well, based on the last information that we have received, compared to 1970, we already faced the loss of 50% of the coverage of glaciers that we had in 1970. Some of the cordilleras have a lost level of 80 or 90 percent of the coverage, an absolute loss of snow coverage in some glaciers below 500 meters above sea level. This is uh, an impact on the water availability and how we're going to handle for example, high productivity agriculture, like the one we have in the coast. Because the retreat of glaciers is taking place on a seasonal basis. Now, why this has not been faced properly? It has understanding this as a flat figure, or should we understand it in the reality, like this profile where we see uh, the diversity in the territory and the potential with these types of climate, different types of potentialities. We have seen this, and we have related that to the capacity of production in agriculture, different crops in different areas that we can find in the country. But this also brings a level of, because the climate conditions change, and that is what we are predicting, that could have a very significant impact in the crops or at the end of the economic activities. This comes from a study of assessment of potential impact of climate change on the crops in Latin America. This is for Peru. The effect that the climate change could have in some predictions that are being made about coffee, we see that there is a very significant problem. And coffee is our main product of export from the country. It is linked to the generation of 
well-being for a large population located in areas rather marginal, uh, depending on the state and for the other alternatives uh, are to go to coca leaves uh, crops. So this is a model to understand the productive activity. So we have to rethink this. We can see other cases, for instance, it is where we have some ecosystems that are sustained by the moisture and humidity. They have a sustainable use in some cases based on the promotion of tourism. But they are threatened also by the pressure of the lack of planning in the urban areas, by the pressure related to illegal economies, in this case, the traffic. And we see some specific steps of some ecosystems in the country. This is the case of the turfs uh, of wetlands that have this component, organic component. And they have a huge capacity to storage 3.14 million carbon are accumulated in this area. These are equivalent to 60 years of anthropogenic emissions. Multiplied by 60, this is what has been stored here. Is these minerals are called uh, palm trees, uh, wetlands, or peatlands. This is a very important product for the economy of Loreto. If they are lost, we could be contributing to the climate change problem globally in a significant way. So what are some of the alternatives that are being proposed for this area? The first one is to build roads. Well, the road, according to economic studies, if you account the environmental impact, we generate the country a loss of around $100 million, calculated in economic terms. It would prevent the compliance of the commitments that the country has for the reduction of uh, greenhouse gases. There are other projects related to send a transmission line for electricity in the middle of this area in Patasca, where there are other alternatives that could not be so disturbing. For example, in the National Reserve Pacaya Sanibia, where there is populations arriving into that area, we can see situations related to this institutional passages in the country. That are settling down in Ucayali, in Loreto, without respecting the national law. And they have migration documents that are, in this case, well, the, the information should be checked with the authorities of immigration, and when we try to do it, we get only partial information. And facing that, the new model of understanding the productive city has to consider these variables. We have to protect our ecosystems. We have to preserve part of the capacity of this nature bank. We need to make a sustainable use in the management that is part of what has been done in some cases with high or low success, and also the capacity to respond. And we need to start paying the bills. And that goes through restoration. What is the role that society in terms of recovering the productive capacity and to recover our ecosystems that will support the productivity in the long term. I used to be in charge of a project for the development 
in the rural area for sustainment in the jungle area. And we were talking with the producers, the best coffee of the world. They said, for each hectare that I have, I have behind me one hectare and a half that does not produce anymore because I didn't have fertilizers, etc. So we just uh, see that the coffee, we absorb the material when it is depleted, they abandon those hectares. So they said, why cannot we go to the national park for more crops? So we, we told them, if you go to the natural park, you will be at 600 meters above sea level. So you're going to have fungus in your crops. You're going to lose your quality. So what you should do is to look around and look upwards, not downwards. You have to recover the soil that is located in the areas where your production of coffee will have better quality. These coffee growers were between 1,000 and 1,200. So we have to look around and propose models like these ones. And they have successful experiences in a national protected area, Pacaya Samilia, where there is a work alliance between the corporate sector, the state, through the Ministry of the Environment, and the National Service of Protected Areas, civil society organizations, and the communities well organized, generating several benefits like the ones you can see, improving the price that the producers can receive for the sustainable harvesting of the forest. Well, this is an activity that has a long tradition, but since the arrival of a partner with the financial and technical capacities can ensure this production in order to say that the aguaque or the drinks that they are offering does not come from a cut palm tree. It does not come from the improper uh, occupation of the territory to ensure that the community members that are using the palm trees for harvesting, they are doing this in a safe way with harnesses that are designed to prevent the risks. But also this So, what this is doing is breaking paradigms. Yeah, it has a higher cost, yes, no doubt, because, well, we are going to talk about different views, but the logic of each one of these stakeholders is very important. It is also important to change the paradigm of traditional conservation, that protected areas cannot be touched. In some, in our legal framework, some areas can be used in a sustainable way, like this one in the National Reserve. In other cases, that's not possible. National parks or sanctuaries, because of the characteristics that they have, it is not possible to do something like this. But there are many areas and protected areas where this model could be replicated. How simple was this to transfer it to areas that have a lower governance level? That is a challenge in which the private sector, the mining sector, could have an important role replicating this in other areas of the country. And this has some things that are happening all over the world. There is a farmer managed natural regeneration. So we should go beyond the increase of production focus on a broader view as to how the production is linked to healthy ecosystems, to productive ecosystems, and also to the ecosystems, how do I manage the health of the soil. Here you can see 
This collective has published this week about the effect that some interventions are going through under the logic of regeneration of the natural managed farmer. We can see the increase in the yield of 100%. That's due to natural regeneration. Different types of interventions that are taking place. Water conservation, is, we see the increase to 170%. And conservation cropping systems, between 15 and 35%. So we see that investments are showing the capacity for regeneration. And they are leaving the mere logic of social responsibility to investing in something that is really linked to the generation of new conditions, stakeholders. Finally, just to close, this potential of this new look has to have this broad approach, this approach that it's being discussed by one gen. There is no way to ensure the human health if I don't ensure the environmental health. The environment is sick and it doesn't have the capacity to provide uh, means for, li for life. I won't be able to ensure uh, when I'm going to provide good health to people. We see how the, we rebuild the production paradigm. The idea is that we should support this, and I think this is an interesting challenge that is building based on initiatives like the one I have told you. Thank you, Gabriel. Is 12.30, so it will be great. We have gone through the review of different uh, different partners sharing the ideas. We have now have this general overview, and we have also looked at some detailed examples. So maybe Francisco, Lupe, you can share some of your ideas. How do we do in order to work together? How do we do to work as a team and gain the trust of those different silos? And what to do differently? Which are the things we need to prepare in order to support ourselves in uh, circumstances where we have non-linear uh, situations that may probably impact us like the pandemic. Francisco and Lupe, it's the, this is like a coffee session. Gabriel, if you would like to intervene, the others will apply for Maria Fernanda and Ole as well, who are with us still today. So great. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Angromin, for um, sharing all these different experiences and innovations uh, with all of us. As uh, you mentioned, Carlos, thank you for your coordination as well. I think it's important to know exactly how we work as a team. I'm uh, working on sustainability, conservation, in, and how we get together in order to achieve those goals. We have been working isolated, as you said, in silos and our different areas of expertise in our fields of uh, profession uh, development where we do not necessarily work together with our neighbors. Agromin is a great example to bring together mining and agriculture together. The process of creation and creation of strategic alliances within Agromin, collaboration plays an essential role. We have seen throughout the presentations uh, this morning all the different innovation aspects and collaborations in the specific scenarios that were shared. But I think it's about time to bring it to a larger scale. Climate change.
different level. Areas that, depending on the temperature and climate, have been affected considerably or not, or less necessarily. In the highlands, we see a stronger impact compared to the rainforest, for instance, that they are still being impacted. So, what to do in order to achieve the mining, social, environmental, agricultural development? by reducing emissions, by reducing greenhouse gases and compensating at the same time. Compensating on all these uh, different actions that did not allow us to get up to very positive results environmentally speaking. So we were looking at infrastructure. Infrastructure is uh, probably part of the mining sector, yes. We will talk about road construction, transmission lines, ports, etc., dams. These are all infrastructure projects that definitely support the economic sector and the social sectors and environmental sector as well. So these three different components on sustainability. This uh, infrastructure, what is called gray infrastructure, has to be integrated to green infrastructure related to all these different land projects. So agricultural land, forestry, natural areas, protected areas, uh, areas in all these conser corridor, conservation corridors, different projects, uh, the watershed level. So basically, green and gray have to come together so no we need to look at this in the stage how do we join agriculture how do we join green infrastructure within a connectivity framework within the uh, view of promoting ecological values that will allow to to be and to keep on and promoting sustainability but you also have the coastal and marine areas Everything will be promoting economy because we need infrastructure to survive. We need infrastructure for transportation means and, trans and ports at the same. But we also have blue inf infrastructure. When we think on ports needed to trade internationally, you see a huge amount of value the reconstruction modernization of national ports for Peru, the international port development as well, have to be closely integrated with this blue infrastructure. So these marine coastal infrastructure have to support ecosystemic systems, everything the ecological future of those areas that provide food and this ecological marine ecosystem services that will allow us uh, to survive together with the future generations. Everything will be also impacted by the changes of temperature, bad carbon emissions. And we've been listening to this constantly, how to decarbonize our economies. How can we compensate what we have been doing so far to reduce those levels of carbon aggressively? So it is not you or me, it is us. We are all in the same boat and we'll be all impacted through this. So. How can we collaborate? How do we cooperate? Based on trust, isn't it? And the capacity to have different strategic partners that we can still integrate and create and search for priorities for climate change and align them with the conservation and development in a sustainable manner. This should come from different sectors. It's not only the biologists, us, or the government. No, it should come from all the different stakeholders. We are, again, as I said, in the same boat, and we should keep on moving in order to promote. How, how to think on the integration, especially on green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, gray infrastructure, within our sustainable processes for the future, but also in what it's already been embedded in. How do we, we invent the systems? 
economy is pretty important. Our industry is pretty strong with really high standards uh, that were developed nationally, internationally, to share good practices in different sectors. We can even improve more and more, but we need to work as a team together so that we can support. Innovation is part of all the different components. We have been discussions in the UN at the country level internationally. So we have the sectors that have been moving towards this new direction on innovation and climate change, as we have heard. They also have sectors such as Madre de Dios, illegal mining, etc. They are uh, carbonizing, whereas other groups are decarbonizing. They need to unify forces. We need to try to uh, set a stronger strategy so that we can reinforce the industry on the one hand, which is doing it quite well, but also supporting in creating mechanisms that will take groups away out of the field. So basically, I will now give the floor to Lupe, so he, she can share the comment. Lupe, share your thoughts with us. First of all, thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. Thank you, Agromin. I'm very pleased and happy uh, to be with you. Thank you. I've been hearing of the different speakers throughout the day, and there were so many different topics, but when you think on which is the common topic that linked all these different presentations, I would probably would like to highlight some of the different ideas as were shared to bring that together and maybe the one word that I'll be hearing is transformation, change. Transformation and change. Ole throughout his presentation said and he talked about transformation, a substantial transformation. And I believe that all of us uh, listening to this now who are been talking on a steel industry. But he said, it was amazing, isn't it? He is talking on innovation technologies that totally changed the whole value. And it says things could be done differently. You have green steel. And what he stated at the very end, we should not only change the technology, but the technological change such as the one that he explained. That change changes on when, who, as he said, still how many years was work like this. But because of climate change and challenges climate change and because of the need of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and the commitment, the pledges of European countries. So think on everything what is behind to push that change, the technological change. It is a problem, it is a challenge, it's a commitment, a political pledge and because of that, the company is just creating this huge transformational change. So there is a purpose that will lead to a transformation, in new changes in the value chain. So basically, facing climate change, which is the largest planetary challenge. What can I do myself, right? It, 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 not, not me necessarily, but, but, but of course I'm asking that myself as an individual in the institution, as a company, as a country, as a region in Latin America, as a planet at the end, right? Because we are all involved in this same challenge. I'll say that we are actually living a great era of transformation and the pandemic has been actually being the trigger, the trigger. The pandemic has arrived as a trigger for a planet to think, to realize that there are specific things that we may believe that may not because of course uh, lots of scientists were already aware of the threat of the pandemic but facing this pandemic we 
So changes of behavior have come in all the different ways of doing things. And in a year or two so far, you have a vaccine that a few years ago to normally take years to produce. So the level of response of human is huge, but we are not making preventive measures. The pandemic have shown us all the different talents, all the limitations of the health sector and our capacities to work together. When we talk about transformation and change and teamwork, one thing that comes to my mind is the level of uncertainty raised by change. And uncertainty leads to fear, fear to change. Yes, it is human. Yeah, we, we uh, felt threatened, we are afraid, and that's normal. But then you need to change everything in order to face those challenges. But that means you have a different behavior. I call it the behavior of the learner. We should all be uh, the ones that we need to learn, that need to feel like apprentices ourselves because we have a main goal to solve climate change crisis and all countries all of you may be aware of the fact that all countries commit pledge themselves to what we call decarbonization by 2050 from now on 2021 22 up to 2050 we should carry out this planetary effort to go to zero <laughs> environment to, to decarbonize by 2050 every country and in Peru specifically have that climate challenge to develop mitigation and adaptation measures built upon a conversation among the different stakeholders the private public uh, sector, maybe many of you have been already part of that process and within those commitments and pledges you have mitigation and adaptation measures that uh, have to do with agriculture and mining which are the topics we are discussing today so yeah we it, we have already rolled, but yes there are already efforts in place, we know that we need to do that We may need probably more community to know those challenges much better, but we also need to provide continuity to the different efforts applied. It, I don't know, Carlos, whether this is just a dialogue, but I think it's important just to give this uh, framework something that we need to build together. I may have other comments, but I will leave it now here. Yes, of course, of course, uh, or we are always uh, restricted on time, but uh, maybe Gabriel and, and Lupe, you can then uh, reflect on what to do, this bottom-up approach, up-down approach, how to relearn, how to learn. Uh, we, we believe as experts that we know so many things, but at the end we do not know active listening, learning. How will all these fit into this big work uh, to build together it real? What do you think? Basically, uh, what I just shared, I don't know, especially you, what do you think we should do in order to uh, comment on that? Uh, I think that what should come from the different fields? Yes, we need to make decisions um, from the upper areas so that climate change measures can be applied. Sometimes we forget about something, and I believe that the pledges of the countries through their governments and states in the UN right like the decarbonization by 2050 or this other idea that has been discussed on biodiversity protection um, when you think on who produces this you most of the time except from some few countries where the state has a production 
in most of countries. Those results are uh, written by non-public uh, stakeholders. Sometimes it is uh, some stakeholder uh, that is thinking on uh, whether they move on uh, and cut the specific trees and a frame forest or whether that other individual that will use a specific Resource. Basically, what you say is that the, the practice should be probably linked through the public uh, policies uh, provided by the government so that uh, this whole conduct may be changed. So I think it is just a two-way direction, not only a bottom-up or a top-down approach. I think that especially on the potentialities on restoration, for instance, and I, I recall that there were lots of millions uh, uh, being discussed in the case of restoration for Peru. This is huge. Let's say if a big player, a big uh, to recover 2,000 hectares at this point, they can. We, we can. We can provide in that specific. Uh, uh, well, first of all, we do not have these 2,000 continuous uh, hectares of land for restoration purposes, but our legal framework is, is not providing the warranties to, to do so. So, uh, so that this could be feasible and attractive. So again, these are the things that we need to review uh, at the top level as a country. So thank you, Carlos. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Maria Fernanda was raising her hand, so I will give the floor to her, Maria Fernanda, uh, and then you, Pancho. Thank you, first of all, uh, to Agromin and Carlos uh, to give me the floor there for your invitation. I just wanted to make a brief comment for the uh, timber industry, what is happening, as, as you is saying, is that we're working as a team and they're trying to make things work. And then we need to uh, work towards this decarbonization, but what we have been experiencing, especially uh, worldwide, is to look at what type of materials could be used for uh, avoiding pollution. So all these different boards, timber woods, uh, was commenting on uh, it's exactly the type of solutions that we were to implement. So th this is just a, a big step, I believe, to see how we can get to a storing um, carbon in our structures. And, and as you said, uh, agriculture also plays an important role, but I just and especially like in the examples of coffee to involve the different stakeholders like the government and other private uh, sectors uh, to, to, to get up to that specific level. I think that was just um, what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Franz, maybe you would like to finish your presentation and it will be great to uh, hear more of your thoughts. Uh, yeah, uh, it will be a pleasure, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, maybe my final words in, in relation to this topic. I believe that we definitely need to change our mind to um, have the, the disruptive ignorative chip in and to, to try to go beyond the trends in our learning by developing methodologies in the same way as we used to. How do we stop those processes? Change uh, worldwide, and uh, probably that will be also seen in Peru. In order to do so, we need to question ourselves. We need to question, keep on constantly questioning ourselves, our processes, uh, the legal framework, the way we've been working, the way we have been working in silos or in cooperation. That is so important because it will make us think on how to re 
change and it faces new goals and challenges that we want to achieve at the climate change level. We need to also pay attention, pay careful attention to what the others are doing. Uh, we were talking about uh, right, natural resources, agriculture, together with mining. This, if you may think now that won't work, but if you see two industries working together, very important industries in economical terms, social and cultural terms as well, what do we do? What does that, that make it different so that you can improve the other? When we apply this multiplier factor to other industries, to other sectors, the possibility of innovation increases considerably. And this is probably related to what you say at the very beginning, cooperation, collaboration. We need to do so. And we have very good examples of big corporations, Apple and other companies, that will be based on observation coming from different fields to create innovative products that are now And next, experiment. The conservationist, the producer, the miner. Let's have a look at what they do and see how can we change or improve to achieve the same goal at the end, because at the end we will have a common goal. How to decarbonize and compensate the carbon emissions that we need to reduce considerably from the environment. Keep on living. The observation part is also essential. Experiment as well. There's no failure or errors. It is feedback. Every time there's a mistake, we learn from something. We learn from the mistakes and then more times that if we were making those mistakes. So it is important. And finally, I believe that the capability of connecting, networking, how do we interact with these other different stakeholders or industries? How do we probably interact with other speakers from different fields that could contribute to the economic and social enhancement and how to work together for a client to uh, keep on with our quality of life? Thank you. Thank you for this space and time. And we are here to collaborate and keep on creating innovation together. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Francisco, Lupe. We are uh, almost finishing this section. It's such an interesting conversation. I may probably discuss something that you also mentioned, education. I believe that education is so important. It, 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 all these different possibilities should be included or framed in their education, formal, non-formal education. We if, if I were to say, which are the things that we need to learn from nature, to copy those examples on sustainability, for instance, we are all talking, companies are talking about sustainability, isn't it? So nature has been used in sustainability forever and ever. Which are the lessons that we have learned? I think four of them. Everything is circulated. Everything is recycled. Circular economy, therefore, and the usage of these products in, uh, in the industry level as well. The second lesson, in nature, biodiversity, uh, sustainability of the ecosystems, promoting biodiversity, therefore, it's essential. If we do not promote it, we will have the pandemic, for instance. So this lesson on diversity, ensuring sustainability of an ecosystem is also very important because we need to talk together. We need to sit together, organize a team. We cannot uh, still be working by what is happening and forget about the others. I mean, mining and agriculture is a very first step to have this broader approach. The third lesson, solar energy, clean energy, the energy of the sun, 
in nature. This is due to climate change. Okay, if we look at it, nature gives us lessons to ensure sustainability and education, training, sharing among different sectors like we're doing at this conference and also the willingness to learn, open-mindedness and the capacity of learning no matter what age, the flexibility, the openness and the possibility to incorporate innovation in our lives. Not only technological innovations, but also public policy innovation on how we work together on education. Thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity. I'm very pleased and I've learned so many things in this first panel um, and then during the whole morning with all these different comments and suggestions that have been so nourishing and so inspirational. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all panelists for the present, the speakers. Agramin should uh, probably take this specific topic and then meet together at some point in another space so that we can keep on talking on working together for the benefit of our country from mining, from agriculture, and other different uh, fields. You should not be, still be working in silos, but together we should move ahead for our country because we have lots of resources especially human beings from all the different directions and connections we need to come closer together pro development in order to face climate change thank you thank you very much fernanda i'll give sorry paula fernanda i'll give you the floor thank you agrami thank you such an interesting panel and discussion. Thank you, Carlos Loret de Mola, for being of this fact. I will invite all of you to please turn on your cameras to take a final family photo. We understand that these are such an important topic that, and we need discussions are so important. It is important to listen to all the different voices to create and build an agenda for the well-being of all the world is, belongs to all of us. And that's a reality, as you said. To push the care together. Thank you all for your participation and experiences with all of us. Um, it will definitely be a topic that you can discuss further in another space. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, we yes, you should all turn your cameras. I only see <laughs> we will have now a break, a lunch break, and you can come and visit the exhibit. You have different sounds online, so you can come and visit the platform. And you can look and visit the exhibitors. Poderosa Mining Comana, Ferreros, Ingemer, Ipesa, La Peru, the Ministry of Energy and Mining, New Monjana Cocha, Sociedad Minera Cerro Verde, Southern Peru, IGH Group, Minsur, Monsal y S.A., Montali Cake, in the German Peruvian Chamber of Trade, Adams, Wiscom, Chile, Habde Peru, Cite Papa, and others Peru, Agap, the associations of producers in Peru, Internet, and Soup, Pebble X, 
contratista SAC, Pantrum y SAC, SRK Consulting Perú, Asociación Los Andes de Cajamarque, ALAP, Museo Agua Tierra, Corporación Others, de Potato Museum, de Perú Latia, Taca Innova, CITE, Agroindustrial Moquegua. So all of them are participating in this online trade show. We invite you to visit them in the platform. At 3 p.m., we will be continuing today's session and we will look at different changes and we will have two different sections. Thank you for your participation. We'll be back at 3 p.m.